All right, everybody, come on in. Let's grab a seat. How you doing, Dan? Come on in and take a seat. We got the famous haves and wants microphone up here, so. Come on in, hand out those last few business cards. And we've got the, the live stream about to get going here, we hope. Plenty of seats up front. That's where you get the best information. That's right, you get picked on. There's no, there's no picking on you tonight. Here's Lisa. We'll pick on her, though. Why not? Let's get a good pastime. Come on in. So for those of you that are getting a head start on the night, we do make sure that every month we do haves and wants. How many of you guys have done haves and wants? One person. So Lisa, you're going to get up tonight and do haves and wants? Okay, perfect. Hey, Ron, it's a little, it's a little echo. I don't know if uh, is it just my ears or it sounds like I'm in a tin can a little bit. That sounds a little better. Awesome. All right, so we do haves and wants. So what we have you do is have you line up on this side against the wall, and if you have some real estate or real estate-related stuff that you'd like to talk about, or you want some real estate or real estate related stuff, this is the best time to give yourself a little 30 second commercial to come up and tell us who you are, what you have, how we can reach you. So say you've got a, a, a house for sale in uh, Orange County, LA County, Riverside, wherever you're, you're hailing from, come up, tell us what it is, what you want, excuse me, what you have, how much you want for it, and then tell us how to reach you. And that's one of the best ways to get yourself noticed out here so that this is how, if you can't practice in here, be awful hard to go out there in the marketplace, although maybe not right now. How many people have inventory right now? Raise your hand. Is it hard to sell it when you've got it? Not that hard. Is it hard to find it? A little harder to find it? So we probably should find a lot of people on that wall that, that want real estate. So this is a good chance for you. It's free. It doesn't We don't charge you to do haves and wants. We do want you to be interactive. So line up against the wall over here. We'll have you come up. We'll give you 30 seconds. Tell us who you are, what you have, or what you want and how to reach you. So if you're a, a realtor, you're a mortgage lender, if you're an investor, you're a wholesaler, if you're looking for wholesalers that you want to buy from, tell, us, tell them where you're looking. And, and this is a great way to get your name out there, right? Now then we also have the meeting after the meeting. We hang out in the lounge, uh, have, a little, have a few drinks, talk, and that's where a lot of business gets done, right? That's where you can you know, get a little more in depth and, and meet some of the, the powerhouse women we have over here, like Renee and Patty, and get up there and Talk it up, okay? So good, we got a few people say, I try to stretch that as long as I can because you guys get a little nervous, I think, sometimes. And what do they say next to, to uh, death and taxes? You got public speaking, right? Uh, I, don't, I don't see what's a big deal. I'd rather talk than die or go to the dentist or something like that, too. So we'll start it off here. Come on up. Tell us who you are, what you have, and how we can reach you. Yeah, I'm hoping I'm at the right award ceremony. <laughs> no? Okay, here we go. My name is Daryl Coster, and my number is 714-305-2990. And as many of you know, interest rates are extremely low. I am a residential loan officer, and I can offer loans up to $15 million for one to four units. These are for primary investment properties and purchases. We can use a non-occupant co-borrower's income to qualify in some of the loan programs. Self-employed borrowers are also welcome. Okay? I offer conventional government FHA VA loans. Come see me. I'll gladly approve your loan. It's very simple, very quick. And again, my name is Daryl Coster. My phone number is 714-305-2990. Nine zero and my cards are in the back. Thank you. Fantastic. All right, show, you showed us how it was done. Thanks, Daryl. Come on up, Tom. I'm Tom Hubach, and I've got uh, two co-workers looking for houses, one in uh, Long Beach, Lakewood area, or Cypress, 
another in the Huntington Beach Mountain Valley area, uh, my phone, 714-881-9515. Houses, looking for coworkers having needing houses, the retail buyers in the Long Beach Lakewood Cypress area or Huntington Beach Fountain Valley, 714-881-9515. Thanks. All right, Tom. Lisa, come on up. Okay, Tom, I'm a realtor, so I can help them in Huntington Beach. As long as the price point's right, I don't want to work lower. Oh, she has to put that in there. I'm just saying. <laughs> I find flips for investors, um, so I find uh, deals. Anyway, I'm not good at public speaking, but I find flips for investors as long as I get the listing. So I get two sides of the commission. That's why I get super busy, so I'll work with some retail buyers. Um, I'm good at getting appraised values to come in, and I'm good at marketing the home. My number is 949-302-4946. Also, if you have cash and you want to invest, uh, my um, investor groups are always looking for cash. So, again, 949-302-4946. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Come on up. Hello, everyone. I'm Matt Meyer. I'm with the Trustee Capital. We're a small family business, hard money lender based out of Irvine. Um, I brought my dad with me today. He's the big gun, so uh, we'll be in the back of the room. Where's Feel the big gun? Raise your there hand, big is. gun. All right, there's that's, the big gun. That's the big guy right there. All right, there. I just want to make sure. So uh, we'll be in the back of the room. Feel free to come back and introduce yourself. Again, my name is Matt Meyer. My phone number is 949-322-4102. Thank you. Awesome. Come on up. Hello everyone, my name is Colleen. My phone number is 949-702-7449. Thank you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was pretty short and sweet. I just was so tempted, I had to do it. <laughs> my name is Colleen Brady. I'm with UDirect IRA, and what I'd like to tell you about is uh, founder of UDirect IRA's Karen Hall. And on June 8th, she, along with CPA, um, CPA's uh, Keystone and um, Keystone CPAs and Bruce Norris will be speaking at the Cutting Edge Financial Tactics Brunch. So I will have flyers on the back table. It's a great way to get a, a half day of uh, great information. Thank you so much. And if you have any, any questions about self-directed IRAs, by all means, that's what we do. I have information on the table, of course. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen. Come on up. Hey, lots of Sean's, lots here. Of Sean's here. Perfect. Uh, this is actually my first time here tonight. This is a clever idea. I love it. We are uh, clever. Guys. <laughs> I just uh, moved down to Orange County from Venice. Uh, I'm kind of a part-time investor right now, looking to go full-time. I just finished a rehab up in Lawndale, a uh, nice little single, maybe a double. Uh, looking for my next rehab project. Uh, inventory is tough to find, so if you're a wholesaler, you've got a fix and flip property, you're an agent looking to make double commission, would love to say hello and meet you. Uh, I also do private lending out of my IRA. I have a couple of rental properties, so I get involved in a number of different ways. You'd be very popular if you give your phone number out. 425, from Seattle, 444-0434. And I've got cards, too. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Sean. Come on up. Hi, my name is Scott Mednick. I'm a rehabber, and I can't believe I'm on this side of the fence. Usually I'm begging people for deals. I have one for sale. <laughs> Believe it or not, it's in Costa Mesa, major fixer, has foundation issues. It's taking me away. And, and I know people are laughing. It's just the slats. I don't no, they're think... laughing because they're going to buy it from you. Oh, okay, That's great. They're laughing. Cool. Sold. <laughs> um, like I say, it's in Costa Mesa. I'm asking $520 for it, and it's worth $650 today, probably $700 in about 40 days from now. Um, so it's a phenomenal location, uh, 73 and 405. If anybody's interested, give me a call. Now, if it's your first time doing a flip, don't call me because this will overwhelm you. Everything needs to be replaced except for the windows. Those are two years old. Kitchens, bathrooms, everything, gone. The roof actually is okay. So if... Don't, don't oversell it. No. <laughs> Basically, this is a piece of crap, okay? This is the worst house you've ever seen, but it's the ones you want to buy. So, you don't know me very well. This is definitely not the worst house. I've been. Where's Derek? Derek and I have some of the worst houses okay. you will ever see. All right. So what's your so, phone number, Scott? Okay, my phone number, 949-632-2600, 949-632-2600, and uh, call me the next day or two. Perfect, Thank you. Scott. Thank you. All right, Lynn. Hello, my name is Lynn Hubach, and I've got Hazel Eyes. 
name of my company as well, Hazelize Investments and Hazelize Ventures. Uh, I am looking for people that are fairly new in the business, that want to learn, and that want to play cash flow. It's a great way to network, and it's a fabulous way that I raise private money. Um, I'm a money magnet. My name is Lynn Hubach, 714-585-5386. Come connect with me. Thanks, Lynn. Come on up, Angel. Oh, and JJ. Is it a package deal tonight? Yeah. All right, fair enough. Well, it's part of the topic. So, All right, perfect. Um, I'll do the first part. Yes, yes. Yeah, wait, where's um, our little heart? Okay, well, first off, you have to understand we're both here together. We're women, just like women always go to the restroom together. We run a all-women's real estate club, only women's real estate club. So it's in El, El Segundo, the last Tuesday of every month. Sorry, guys, but it's a great group of women. How many women have been to this club before? It's awesome. Open forum discussion. It's part of the Phoebe organization so we'd love to have you if you want more information there's information in the back of the room on the yellow orange sheet and then JJ I can uh, JJ JJ San Jose that's my website also you can contact me at JJ San Jose com Scott I'd love to talk to you because I do rehabs that's all I do all day I just actually drove up the five from South County so <laughs> I'm feeling for you I'll do major stuff anywhere you know anywhere from you know Adding a bedroom to something that's like she buys in Compton, 000. bro. She's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'll buy in Compton, but I'll also buy you know larger homes where the rehabs you know in the hundred, hundred fifty range, anything like that. So I'm not afraid of any type of rehab at this point. Um, so give me a call seven one four six five seven three eight five three. My website again jjsanjose.com, and you can contact me on there as well. Awesome. Thanks, ladies. Renee. Hi, um, Lev Tom. I'm a, a homeowner to be looking to buy a place. Um, what I found is I feel very um, outpriced in the market. I work for one of the male, um, many failed financial institutions littering the American landscape, and because of that, my salary has been decreased. Um, I am employed. I'm a good, solid, qualified FHA um, buyer. What I'm looking for is a duplex in either Anaheim or in Fullerton. Um, I just signed up for uh, Sean's property radar and it is really amazing and what I found out of that that there are 1500 two to four unit properties in Anaheim so I've already mailed to the ones in Fullerton but there's a whole 1500 more maybe they're bigger than what I can afford but anyway if somebody has a lead um, I'd prefer two separate units on a lot versus an actual duplex but um, at this point I'd look at anything so oh my number is 213-448 uh, Five three one four, and again, my name is Renee. Good job. Hi, my name is Derek Williams. I actually work with Justin Williams. Four, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's very, that's very distinct point, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> He's also my brother, so. Uh, now we get it. But I'm over acquisitions. Um, he and his company closed over a hundred <laughs> houses last year. Uh, so very serious buyers, um, and we'll we'll buy anything as long as it makes sense, any size. Um, here's my number. What's that? No, just, that's my just, deal, dude. You can't have Ogden. That's mine. Yeah, we won't go. We just we just <laughs> bought one from Sean. So right. Uh, number is seven one four four nine seven zero six four eight. Give me a call if you want to talk, and we'll do it. Awesome. Good group of guys. Even they're working for each other, right? Come on up. <clears throat> Hello, my name is uh, Victor Feliciano. Um, I, uh, I'm a broker and an investor. We have two homes for sale right now. One is in the city of Monrovia. Uh, it's priced at uh, 598, and we got another one in Silver Lake for 100. Uh, I'm sorry, 590. I say 100 sold. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Silver Lake is uh, 599. So if you guys are interested, you can call my wife directly at 909-376-6130. Uh, they They're completely done. Yeah. Retail. Awesome. Thank you, Victor. Mr. Tan. Mr. I know. Sorry. I'm Bill Tan. Um, I run a couple clubs, one in San Diego on the second Tuesday, one in Arcadia on the second Wednesday. And I'm here to tell you that I'm here to teach some classes. Uh, the classes are creative financing, real estate techniques and strategies, and the advanced financing techniques and strategies. The creative financing class will be July 27th and 28th, 
if you sign up for both classes, I will throw in, as a bonus, my calculator class. Who's taking a calculator class? Renowned calculator class. Renowned. My name is Bill Tan, 760-519-9192. Fantastic, Bill. Come on up. It's closing it out. Back and clean up. Hi, I'm Greg Walden, and I buy fix and flip properties as well as buy and hold. Uh, single family and commercial property. I just finished two that I picked up from a wholesaler here a couple of months ago. I'm looking for more. Also provide private capital out of my solo K account. My number is 310-850-9918. 310-850-9918. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Give a big hand to everybody that did haves and wants. It's not as easy as you think when you get up there and you get the red face and you little stutter on your words, but I encourage everybody to do it because, again, you can practice in here without pressure so that when you have a sit down with a seller or a buyer, the words come a little easier. Does that make sense? How many people are here for the first time? Okay, that's great. And if you're here for the first time, it may just be that you've never been to this club, but if you're completely new to real estate, a lot of times it can seem a little overwhelming where to go, who to see. What we've done is we've got an orange sheet. and Some of you may have got it. If not, we've got it in the back. And what this does is this has a list of resources. This has a list of clubs that we uh, go to, that we've been to, that we recommend. Bill Tan is on there. Where's our Invest Club for Women members? Raise your hand if you're an Invest Clubber. Do we have Bobby Iris here tonight? Are they in Mongolia or something like that? Skydiving out of, with an elephant out of a <coughs> boat somewhere? OK. Um, well, we have a collaborative effort with Invest Club for Women, and so those of you that are Invest Club uh, for Women members got in for $10 tonight, right? That's fantastic, and we have a reciprocal relationship. If you're an Invest uh, Investors Workshops member, that is indicated by what? Our gold cards. How many of you have seen the gold cards? Well, if you've got a gold card, right, what that entitles you to is $10 entry to Invest Club for Women general meetings. It also gets you into the bonus session. How many of you guys are in the bonus session tonight? We were able to learn about Bitcoin and bit flipping from David Farney. That we open the doors 30 minutes early for you if you're a gold card member. So we encourage you guys to look at that and see if membership works out for you. Uh, it's, it's a way for us to make sure that we keep providing you with good education so that when Andy Mirza decides to show up, how you doing, Andy? You stayed safe. Give a hand for Andy. Goes overseas, works, keeping us safe over there. Got to love it, man. That guy is uh, one of the hardest working guys I know. Good to see you, Andy. So this is where we'd recommend that you guys go, get some, yourself some good, solid education. I talked to you guys about the gold card. Please look into it. Uh, it's something that, uh, again, we try to offer you some great benefits. We give you some discounts. We give you some extra content. We are streaming the meeting live. And how many of you guys have watched the meeting on the internet before? Well, here's the cool thing. Our tech guys, I want to give a shout out to Ron and Lowell. Give us a big hand back there. Did it bother you guys that there were commercials that would pop up in weird times? It doesn't happen anymore because they fixed it. So we're using Google uh, Hangouts Plus now. And it actually is going to record it like a DVR. So you can actually go on any time and you can back up, stop, start, and then you can go back and rewatch it. There's only one commercial at the start now. they got, they got to pay the bill somehow, I guess, over there at Google. But tonight's our, our, we're launching it tonight. So when you go home and if you miss something, you know, I can be kind of boring. Usually I try not to be. But Sean, I don't know, that guy can really bore us to tears tonight. You can go back and rewatch it if, in fact, like he's even admitting it, you know? He said, I'd catch a flight out tonight if I thought I could. But we, we captured him here. So you can rewatch it. And uh, I tell you what, I've gone back. And those of you that came to our 10 year anniversary, we gave you some, uh, some of our meetings, right? A couple, three years. Audio, anybody listen to those? Did you pick something up the, the second or third time you listened to it? Man, I'm smarter than I thought I was a lot of times. So was Bill. I was like, Bill, man, you're smart, man. I listened to you again. So sometimes re-watching the content we've given you helps out. Um, I do have some, uh, I'll be, this Saturday, I'll be at the Bruce Norris event. It's really, really oversold. So how many of you guys are already registered and planning to attend? I'll see you there. Hey, listen, if you change your mind or something happens, you can't go, and you call the Norris Group, they've got people waiting in line to try to get a seat. It's going to be at this hotel, actually, in this room and the rest of this room over here. And uh, Bruce is going to be talking about how to make a million dollars in the next 24 months in California. So I'm excited to hear about that. But he's also teaching July 13th is his next timing seminar. If you've never been to a Norris timing seminar, probably should go. A lot of people made a lot of money in this very room or watching us on the Internet. 
It's called Fast, Furious, and Dangerous. Pretty ominous. Is it fast right now? Yes. Is it furious right now? Yes. Can you make some money right now? Yes. Can you also lose some money right now? You bet. So it's usually pretty good when I, when I have Bruce, when I have a chance to hear Bruce, I would encourage you to go. And uh, the, the proceeds of this seminar are going to um, uh, I Survived Real Estate. How many of you guys have been there? Black tie event, really cool. The proceeds are going to St. Jude's Children's Hospital and who is the second? A Make-A-Wish Foundation. So make all kids stuff. Um, don't make a wish this time? Man, I'll tell you what, I had something in my eyes the whole time last time. I was crying like a little baby. I called my kids. I love you kids. I tell you, watch, uh, watch where that money goes directly to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. So if you can make it out, that's great because, again, um, SDCIA and Investors Workshops are platinum sponsors for that charity event. Um, how many of you guys like to eat lunch? I eat too many lunches. I get it. Stop teasing me. Okay. How many of you guys have ever been to the OC Investors Lunch? JT Schmidt's at the district. That's now going to be an Investors Workshops Lunch. We worked that out with uh, Misha and Deborah, and we're going to be running that lunch. So you'll see, you'll see, yeah, you'll see me over there. You'll see Angel over there. If you want to just see Angel, not me, let me know. I'll just stop going over there. No, I don't need any more lunches, that's for sure. But uh, this Friday is Ginger Macias. Do you guys know Ginger Macias? She's a wholesaling machine. So she'll be speaking this Friday. And then uh, if you want information on that, we'll be posting that on the Investors Workshops website. So we're excited to have a, see you guys in the daylight. Maybe you'll dress differently. I'm not sure. Maybe you'll behave yourselves better. Where's Jake? Jake's going to be there, right? It's closer for a lot of you too, right? You don't have to. He said, there's only two people I drive the 55 for, you guys and the angels. I feel honored, right? Because that's a tough freeway, right? That's a tough act to follow. And... Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with Dale Carnegie and his teachings? Well, we're going to have uh, Steve Von Berg from Carnegie next month, June 26. He's going to be here. So pulling down some, uh, some heavy hitters there, right? Well, we're trying to bring you guys the best education. We're going to do what we can for you. And again, in the back, we've got Gary Johnston. Now, if you guys haven't been to a Gary Johnston class, he hangs around with this guy named Clyde. Some of you might know Clyde, Clyde Wilson, who's been on the ride with Clyde. Gary Johnston's got his class schedule in the back. And... Uh, you can get his Monday thoughts. Those are cool things. I get his Monday thoughts. And he's got his 2013 class schedule. So you've got a couple events in May, uh, August, <clears throat> and then November. He's also hanging out with a guy named Jimmy Napier. Jimmy's going to be doing a few classes in July in Orange County, and then again in Vegas in November. So, man, that's a lot of stuff to tell you guys about. Sorry, I feel like I've I need a drink of water or something like that. But the, the bottom line here is what we're, we're trying to do for you is give you as much education as we can, point you in the right direction. You know, if you want to do notes, who would I tell you to go to? I'd say go see Gerald. Right? If, I, if, I, if I was looking to loan, uh, borrow hard money, obviously a Norris Group is a great resource. And the neat thing is in this room right now, probably your next deal is in this room. If you just will take the time to turn to your left, to turn to your right, shake hands and pass a card. But you know what we tend to do? We tend to stay with the people we came with. Look at the person next to you. You probably know him already. Why'd you do that? You want to you switch it up a little bit, Sean. Jeez, dude. Move over a little bit. Meet somebody that you didn't know before you came in, okay? Yeah, yeah, too late now, right? I know. You guys aren't going to get up and move. But try that next time, okay? Or hang out afterwards at the meeting after the meeting, okay? Now, I don't know if time permits, but some of you had, I, you know, there was a time gone by where I'd just sketch out a little bit of a, a debrief on the deal that was either done by me or someone that I know. Did you guys like that? You guys want me to, I can sketch one out for you. Do we have time, Angel? Or you guys want to see me sketch out a deal? Okay. So here's the question. Well, I guess we'll do it by a show of hands. You want to see a hold or a flip? That's the first one. Let's see. Raise your hand if you want to see a hold. Buy and hold, right? Hold it to, to rent it. Okay. Raise your hand if you want to see a flip transaction. Ah, dude, that's like almost sixes, isn't it? All right, you want to see it done with cash or you want to see it done with seller financing? Raise your hand for cash. Only one guy cash. I got everybody else seller financing, raise your hand. Man, all right, so, so I guess any hold or any flip with seller financing is something that you guys are interested in? Is that all? Is that all you want? All right, gosh. All right, let me see if I can't 
get my iPad to work. Of course I can because Ron hooked it up. Right? Oh, wait. You got to go to the bathroom, go out the door, turn to your right, and it'll be on your left hand side. That was really important information. Okay? Additionally, you guys, if you got your phones, turn them to silent. Dave. Dave was like presenting in the bonus session, and, and he's, his phone goes off. All right, let's just make sure we got this thing working right. Well, here I went and shot my mouth off. Oh, look at that. It works if it's plugged in. Isn't that always the case? It works if it's plugged in. All right. So we got a, how many of you guys are landlords? Man, you got a lot of landlords out there. It's becoming more popular or what? When I fell asleep and you guys became landlords? How about flippers? Raise your hand. Wholesalers? Some of the same hands go up. Wholesaling's pretty good money right now, isn't it? What is low? What was that? Yeah, it's pretty good money. Okay. How about this one? Well, uh, here's one I want to talk to you guys about. Now, again, I buy in two markets, okay? I buy in Southern California, and I buy up in Utah, okay? So any given day, I'm getting 25 calls a week from both markets, okay? How many of you guys are doing direct mail? Okay, great. Are you consistently doing direct mail? I hope that you are. So first we'll say lead source, okay? Because I think it's important for everybody to know. I mean, I can sit here and tell you what I did, but isn't it important for you to know how I found it too? Is that okay? So lead source, direct mail, okay? And uh, I find postcards work really good. And I find the absentee owner list to be very effective. So first and foremost, you can get a free absentee owner list from your title company. If you don't have a title company that you work with, you know, you pick one, right? You've got First American, you've got Landwood Title, you've got, who else uses one? Who has one that they really like? Raise your hand, shout it out. Chicago Title, great. You're gonna call their marketing person. Right? You're going to ask them for an absentee owner list. And uh, you can get an absentee owner list by county, city, zip code. Okay? And, they're gonna, and here's the cool thing you should probably do. Ask them to sort it for you and get the labels. Now, now, according to the insurance commissioner, they can't give you the labels. But they can usually put it in a printable format that's set up for laser labels. And I find that's easier when I'm going through marking off addresses that I can just set them up and print them out of my labels, okay? That makes sense to you? So absentee owner, get a postcard, get a message on it, something simple like I want to buy your house and so and so and send that sucker out, okay? I put a live stamp on it and I always put my return address. Now, don't put your return address of your house because they're going to show up and like Dave and ask them to model for Abercrombie and Fitch, okay? So put it like a business address or something like that, okay? And especially for you ladies, there's a lot of problems with that, with female realtors and stuff, setting open houses. So don't, for safety reasons, ladies, don't put your home address on the return. Is that fair enough? All right, safety tip. So put somewhere else, all right? Trust me, it has happened and it sucks, okay? <clears throat> now here's the thing. When they call off that postcard and they're going to call you, you got to answer the phone, okay? And you answer the phone and you close for the meeting. What's the one thing I always ask? Those of you that know me. Right, why are you selling? Why do you want to sell a nice house like that? And the reason this is so important, and my penmanship is atrocious, sorry about that. Um, just is, right? Boy, my academy instructors would be really pissed right now if I saw that. Why are you selling? And then you just kind of shut up. And the reason I'm going to say that is this is where you get to most of the deals. Honestly, guys, it's really not that hard. I'm not a master of creativity. I listen to guys like Peter Fortunato. I listen to guys like John Schaub. I listen to guys like the late Jack Miller. <clears throat> and they're very good at what? Asking questions. Does that make sense? And when you ask a question like that and they say, about 
can't make payments. That ever happen? Anybody ever want to sell because they can't make the payments? How about kids live in property and they suck? How would you like to have the double whammy where they said both? We can't make the payments because our kids live in the property and they won't pay the bills. They won't even pay the utilities. Is that a pretty good lead? That's a great lead. And that's the kind of lead that can generate lots of questions. So when they said, I can't make the payments, I said, why is that? Well, our kids live in the property and uh, you know, they're not making, and they won't pay the rent, they won't pay any utilities. As a matter of fact, they're about to have the power shut off and I just had to spend $200 to keep the power on. What was my next question. Why? <laughs> why? Why'd you do that? You know? Oh, they're my kids. I said, it can be kind of hard to kick your kids out, huh? They said, yeah. I said, would you like me to kick them out for you? And he said, would you do that? I said, absolutely. We will kick those kids to the curb so fast they won't know what happened. Okay? And so there was a small problem. I said, how long has it been since you hadn't been making your payments? Okay? And they basically had, uh, I know, it make you guys sick, right? $87,000 in loans. Okay, and their payment is uh, three thousand dollars behind. Okay, so their their payments their payment is about uh, what was it five hundred and ten dollars a month, and so you're about six months behind, right? That makes sense. Did I do my math right. About six months behind, can't make the payments, don't live in the house, kids live in the house. I said, uh, can I go take a look at the house? They said, sure. That was a mistake. I should have worn a, a space suit or a bed bug suit or something like that. Place is not, not too good, okay? So it's a three bedroom, two bath. It's got a $120,000 ARV. What do we call that? Jargon for after repaired value. <laughs> Figure what, they owe 90? with the $3,000 in arrears, right, and $87,000 loan balance. Does that make sense so far? Yeah? And then I get out there and I said, boy, it's going to take about $7,000 in rehab because, I mean, boy, every surface of that place needed to be painted. Carpet was nasty. But it's a three-bedroom, two-bath in an area that's, you know, worth about one twenty, So not too bad. So what are some of the things you can do with that? Well, if you're a flipper, if you're in that thing 97, does it make sense to flip it for, for the difference between 97 and 120? Bill? You want to flip that? Okay, Bill might flip it. Okay. You'd what now? You would finance it. Okay. Anybody else? Is that, is that a margin that you guys want? Is that a good margin? I don't know. You guys tell me. Is this something that you might have to find in Orange County? I mean, 97... 97,000 in it, and then you can sell it for 120. I mean, you pay commissions and everything. If you do a lot of them, it might work. Where's Steve Landis? Steve Landis might do, you know, 500 of these a month or something like that, right? Okay. But you know, anytime I'm presented with that thing, and I'm like, well, you know, what's your loan at? So you basically had $87,000, you know, 8.75%. At Man, that's, that's kind of a high rate right now, don't you think? I'm like, if I can get that $510 payment down low enough, I mean, you know what I can rent that thing for? $1,200 a month. Because the hedge funds are buying the daylights out of there, just like they're buying some of the areas down here. Have you guys seen that? You guys seen that? So $1,200 a month, if I get my payment down to about like 300 bucks, is that good? I would totally like that. I said, hey, why don't you refinance it, and then I'll take it. And he said, okay, that sounds good. So he starts with the, ref with the refinance. And uh, so he just finished the refinance, and the new payment is uh, $312. It's pretty good, right? Is that better than 510 Okay. Who is it? There's this really cool thing called HARP. Have you guys ever HARPed anybody? So he went to the Home Affordable Refinance Program, and they actually give it to him. Yep, tell you what, they gave it to him. I'll give you the name of the lender, Flagship Financial. Yeah, they said, okay, we'll do that. I know, I said, do it, I'd love it. Otherwise, I mean, I would cure his loan for three grand and take it. I don't want an 8.75% loan, but it's not my credit. Is it my credit? Nope. So 
he went through and he got his new payment down to $312 a month. And then he just gave it to us. Does that make sense? Here's the cool part. While he's been going through this, I wanted to get his kids out of there. So we kicked out the kids. Right? He's not making his payment. Am I making a payment to him? Uh-uh. So he gave me the keys. Let me kick his kids out. Shawnee, let me come in. Let me come in. Put the seven grand in it. Put a sign in the yard. We've been collecting rent for like 30 days. I don't have the title of the property, but I get all the rents. How much is so pretty good when you can get it, right? Why, why did he do that for me, Harry? Why did he let me do that? Because I kicked out his kids? Because I promised that he knew he was, uh, you know, he can't make it. He doesn't have the money. He just refinanced it. Does that make sense? Now, what I did, some of you are like, why'd you do that, Sean? That was dumb. I bought an option for 7,500 bucks against the property. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay. You'll learn, right? Suffice it to say this. I didn't just walk in and throw 7,500 bucks at a house that I don't have title to, right? But do I want to own it right now, Jackie? I don't want to own it yet. I want to own it if the guy refinances. And if he doesn't refinance, I'm still going to own it. I'm just going to have to throw another three grand at it. I'm going to have to make a payment higher than I want to. So by having him give me an option to buy that property, and I put in there 7,500 bucks. I hadn't even spent the 7,500 bucks yet, guys. The 7,500 bucks is going to go toward what? Carpet, paint, appliances, fixing it up, right? Right, Derek? You buy whole houses for 7,500 bucks up there, right? So I didn't get quite as good as deal as Derek did, but I get an option for $7,500 recorded against the property. So now what happens? If the bank didn't do the refi, I can cure the loan and I can take the property, and then what? I'm in the property subject to the existing loan. Does that make sense? Right? Funny thing. Got a call from a hedge fund. They realized we bought that property. So let's say, remember I said what I was into it? I'm into it, 7,500 bucks, I have an option on it. They want to give $119,000 for that property. They want to close in 21 days, and they want to pay all cash. I'm like, dang it, I just got to own it first, right? That makes sense? So this one actually has two exits now. I'm collecting rent on an option. I've already fixed it. He just refinanced it. He's ready to deed it to me. So I either deed it to me and keep it, right, or what? Can I, sell it? Can I deed it, have him deed it to me and sell it to a hedge fund? Now, now, Bill, now you might have a little bit of margin in there because there's no realtor on my side. There's no realtor on the hedge fund side. And why does the hedge fund want it? Rents. They bought another one from us four blocks away. They paid $99.5 for it. It's a three-bedroom, one bath. It's an 80-year-old house, and they're renting it for $1,100. So they're after the rents, guys. So getting connected with somebody like we're connected to somebody up there. How many of you guys know hedge fund asset buyers? Anybody? Nobody? Start calling them, man. Start talking to them. They're not, you know, they're not always going to, that, does that make sense to pay $119,000 for a place that rents for $1,200? Does to them, I don't know what, what metric they plugged it in, they'll probably get more than $1,200. What I wanted to show you is that by asking the question, why do you want to sell it? When they tell you, ask them, well, what if I kick your kids out? Some of you probably won't ask that question, right? Would you be afraid to ask that question? Raise your hand. It's, be honest. I don't want to say I'm going to kick your kids out. Well, that's what I do. I'm the kick your kids out guy, okay? I'm the not afraid to buy it and, and know that I have more than one exit for it. So trying to give you guys a blend between one that we can hold or one that we can flip. And uh, the, the whole reason that the hedge fund wants to buy that is they said we can't find them like you guys can find them. And why? Because they didn't put the postcards out. They don't have time to do that. So we're going direct. There was no sign in the yard. It was funny. When you do deals like this, it's the first question that, well, there's two questions. The first one is, are you a realtor? The second one is, how'd you know I wanted to sell? Honest to God, that's what happened. If you guys send out those postcards, people ask you first if you're a realtor, right, Jim? And second, how'd you know I wanted to sell? You're in a pretty good position when that happens because you can say, I'm a buyer, you're a seller, you have a property, I want a property, let's make something happen. So 
The lessons I want you guys to take away from that is market, market, market. In this, in this environment right now, inventory is the king of all kings, right? And if you can get inventory that nobody else knows about, then you will, more than likely, you will win. Who was it that he hit a single? Is it okay to hit a whole bunch of singles in a year? Absolutely, man. Bunt a few times if you have to. It's, that's cool, too. So get in for the least amount of cash, least amount of credit. We don't have any credit risk on this property right now. We have very little cash risk on this property right now. We have multiple exit strategies. And so I think if you guys will apply yourselves, you can put some of these questions to the test, and maybe you can get a few of these transactions going yourself. Take a couple questions before we get Sean up here. Sean, do you want to come start setting up? Did I take your, your dealio here? Okay, right on. Yeah. You know, we're hitting about the same response rate here and there. We're sending the same message to the same list. We're sending out slightly more cards here. We're sending out 500 a week here. Um, we're sending out probably 300 a week there. It's right between 14 and 17 percent. Oh, it's phenomenal. I hate saying it because you guys think I'm lying, but it's, it's insanely huge. And I think it has to do with the fact that we're mailing to a very specific absentee owner list, and we're just very consistent with it. So Wheeler. Sure. Yeah, so we started out everything handwritten with this uh, PaperMate Profile Blue Pen. I really love these pens. I like the size of the font and everything. And then when we started, you know, I was fine when we were doing like 50 a week. And then we wanted to start pushing it. So we went to yourfonts.com, and I had one of the girls that does my stuff. She, it's really cool. You'd print out the thing, and every letter you write, uppercase, lowercase, and then you scan it into this company. And for 10 bucks, they will make a true type font for you. And then when I got the true type font back, I started printing it out on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper in fours. So I print my message and then I just use a paper cutter and cut it in fours, because I'm kind of cheap. Anybody else cheap? Yeah. Then you got four postcards for one sheet of paper. So what you do is on the one side you print your message, and if you use a laser printer, you can actually do highlighting and everything. And when it comes out and you put the set the font to blue, it looks like it was handwritten in blue ink with highlighting. And then the other side, you can do the return address. And if you use the clear laser labels and use the same font, it's really very hard at first pass for them to see that you labeled it. But that's what we did to get more volume. So now we use the laser labels and we, use, we just print directly on the cardstock with uh, yourfonts.com. It's really, again, if you look at it, you can tell, right? I mean, come on. But people get it. It's got a live stamp on it. We still do the live stamp, 33 cent stamp, and that's how we do it. Angel probably knows. Buying the paper, the ink. Right. And we're getting a, a really killer response rate. It, no less than 14%. About an eight cap. Right. So Gerald's saying you can express that as like an eight cap on that for some of these hedge funds or REITs or however they're doing it, right? And everybody's got the reason for buying right now. And for me, I just want to be in the deal as often as I can. And I know that the one thing that the big um, hedge funds and REITs aren't very good at is getting down and getting the, uh, they use a lot of realtors. And there's nothing wrong with that. We got realtors in here. You guys work with them? They use a lot of realtors, but you know, for me, I've always had the best luck going direct to sellers. And I just, you know, I get the cool stories. I get the, I get the, my kids living in the house and I don't want to kick them out and stuff. So, any other questions before we go? Yeah. You know, I, I just pick cities that I know that I want to. He said, email the absentee owners, but what are some of the other criteria? Um, uh, years back, we bought a list of free and clear houses from, I think it was Data Trace. I mean, they're still around anymore. And so we overlaid free and clear homes against absentee owners. And then, of course, any time I get an absentee owner list, my top prospects are the ones that are not just not living in that house, but are actually out of state as well. So the very first way I sort my list is absentee, out of state, free and clear. And then I sort down from that way. So that's kind of, I'm sure that has something, you know, contribution to our response rate. And by the way, anytime somebody picks up a postcard that you set, sent and dials 10 digits and takes the time to talk to you on the phone, 
it's your fault if you don't buy that house because they, they want to sell that house. I can almost guarantee you every time. Bill? Yeah, we're going to talk about that right now. So real quick, last question. You know, I, the, the, right now we have a list of about 74,000. So I haven't run all the way through it yet. I really haven't had to go through it twice yet because the call volume has picked up so much. So I guess the normal wisdom is when I used to mail notice of trustee sales, I'd do five, five weeks of mailers starting on week three and mail through to week eight. I haven't had to do it more than once yet. So I'll let you know if I have to cycle back around again. That makes sense? All right, really excited. We have Sean O'Toole here. And uh, how many of you guys have been uh, fans or users of Foreclosure Radar? Okay, man, it's like, the, the preeminent software out there. And if you're a trustee sale buyer and you weren't using it, you were at a disadvantage to all the buyers that were. Well, I don't want to steal too much of Sean's thunder, but he's launched a new product called Property Radar. I'm a user, I'm a relatively new user. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna introduce Sean. He's gonna walk us through a presentation explaining some of the high points and the features of Property Radar. He's also then gonna talk about how to use Property Radar for you guys to buy then we're going to take some questions at the end and we're going to do kind of our standard interview format. I'm going to ask some questions uh, of Sean about what he's doing in this market, what he thinks, where the market's going, and, and how all this relates. And for those of you that have, haven't seen Sean before, he's a frequent contributor at the I Survived Real Estate event. And uh, we're going to see if we can't get he and Bruce to do a little debate maybe toward the end of the year. Because while they respect each other greatly, they don't have the same opinions every time on what's happening in California. So if we can give a Sean a round of applause, I'm gonna actually sit down here, man, to watch what you're gonna do. Thanks, Sean. Oh, hello, test one, two, three, test. All right, thanks, Sean, I appreciate it. And thank you all for uh, being here. I am very excited to give you a sneak peek at uh, Property Radar. Um, I've been working on it now for about two years, and um, I launched Foreclosure Radar in May of 2007, kind of before the whole foreclosure thing took off, and it turned out to be pretty good timing. Um, but even at that time, there was about 40 auction investors or so in the state, and realtors could care less about foreclosures. And so when I launched Foreclosure Radar, I didn't expect it to be a very big thing, and I had this bigger picture vision of trying to bring a lot more um, accessibility to all real property data, and specifically the public records data. And then, of course, uh, you know, I suspected the foreclosure thing would take off, um, but it took off far more than than I even expected, and um, you know obviously got very tied up with foreclosure radar for quite a while. So only kind of got back to the original vision for the company, like I said, about two years ago. And um, anyways, it's finally out. We launched last week. We actually changed the name of the company from foreclosure radar to property radar. Um, foreclosure radar is still available. Um, Diana Olick this morning uh, tweeted that uh, the housing crisis must be over because we switched our name. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, I'm not quite there. We still have two million folks underwater in California. Um, I think there's still plenty of foreclosures to come. So don't take this as a sign that I think foreclosures is over. Property radar includes all the features that foreclosure radar has. Let me give you just a few other uh, highlights. Um, oops, this page there. Well, okay. So the idea is, um, you know, we've basically taken foreclosure radar and expanded it, doing the same things we did for foreclosures, but now for all properties. And, you know, that, that's really kind of it in its simplest nutshell, but there's some pretty cool stuff that I've had in my mind for a lot of years that we're finally kind of rolling out with this product. We've got our first few modules out. We've got some more modules that are, are coming. Um, and... Um, you know, our goal is to help people find more opportunities and close more de deals. Big, big changes are that we switched, uh, foreclosure radar was built on 
Flash, Adobe's Flash platform, which Steve Jobs killed when he introduced the iPad and said Flash is, is evil. Well, Flash was great for software developers because we could develop a lot of functionality very quickly and very cost effectively. Um, how many people have heard of HTML5? I'm here to tell you it really, really, really sucks. Um, it's very difficult to build an application that works well across multiple browsers, especially one as, as you know, complicated or maybe complicated is the wrong word, but it has as many features as we have. Um, so we put a lot of work into that, but the good news is, is now that we're an HTML5 application, it'll work on your Android tablet, on your iPad, et cetera. So we're now a lot more mobile than we were before. Um, we will be building a dedicated phone version of Property Radar in the future. We don't have that yet. We still have the phone version of Foreclosure Radar. In Foreclosure Radar, we had about 60 search criteria. Now we have over 100. Um, we've got these really cool uh, color illustrated heat maps in explore mode. I can't wait to show you. Lots of ways to pick your geography. We've added things like polygon search and multi-polygon search so you can really drill in and exactly the areas that you want. Um, things like filter buttons, advanced details. You can store your own data, including photos and notes. In fact, Sean, when we were talking earlier, was surprised to see you can purchase a document image. Like, you want to see the document that's the, the loan and see what their interest rate is because you're thinking about trying to do a deal or that kind of thing. You can purchase the do document. But if you also have a relationship with a title company, you want to just call them and have it send it to you for free, you can also upload that and store it so it stays with that, that record. And you can do that for free. Um, and again, all the uh, functionality we had in, in Foreclosure Radar is mostly in Property Radar today. There are a couple things missing for the more advanced users. We don't yet have alerts in Property Radar. We will, and they're going to be badass, way better than they were in Foreclosure Radar. Um, team accounts are not there yet. And then we've got some new modules we're going to be rolling out as well. To me, this is the most important chart right now of what's going on in California. We're talking all about how prices are radically going up, dramat dramatically going up. Um, but we just had our lowest sales volume since 2008 in Q1. So we've got rising prices, but we've got almost no inventory. You know, I, uh, I think, Sean, you shared half the inventory this year versus last in Orange County. And sales are going away. And that's a problem. When I speak to realtor groups, I adamantly tell them that their job this year is to keep our economy going by getting their ass out there and signing up every underwater homeowner they can to do a short sale. Because these transactions, right, they drive a lot of things besides the realtor's commission, right? There's loan officers, inspectors, title companies, and all these, all these other ancillary services that make a pretty big impact on our economy in California. And I think it's really important we try to get this volume back up. And I think the investors here in the room can help as well with that. And the key problem right now is how do you find deals? You know, Sean walked through what he does with postcards, and I'll touch on that and some other things because nothing else much matters other than finding deals right now. Um, if you find deals, they're not hard to sell. They're not hard to rent. I don't care whether you're a flipper or a holder. The hard part is finding the deal. So that's what I'm going to focus on. And we'll get mostly into the, the Q&A side of things. So I'm just going to quickly run through some examples of how we're trying to change the game with, with Property Radar and what's different today with this tool than, than you had before. How many people have driven down the street and seen one of these? Right? And those of you who are good at what you do, you pulled over, you wrote down the address, you went back to the office and you sent an email to your title person, or maybe you have software and you looked it up. What if instead you opened up your iPad, the map was centered on your current location, as you're driving down the street, the map moved with you, right? And you just simply click on that property that's sitting right next to you, and you get all the details. You find out that it's in foreclosure, Right? They're a little bit underwater, but not super underwater. Maybe that AVM's a little low. Maybe this price is actually a little higher than that. Maybe they're about break even. Maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense to, uh, to, to buy this property, but maybe it makes sense to take it subject to and rent it. Right? Like Sean was just talking about, 
lots of other information here, etc. Let's say you are interested in it for whatever reason. You know, oh, sorry, different. Uh, it's a new presentation for me, if you couldn't tell. Um, I'm going to come back to that. So the next thing I want to talk about is our new uh, explore mode. I'm going to come back to that kind of example in, in a minute. But um, sorry, I'm a little thrown. Uh, <laughs> my, uh, my father passed away Sunday, and so I haven't had a chance to review this or anything else. And so bear with me, with me if you can. Um, find the, uh, so we've got this new thing called explore mode. Let me just show you what it looks like, because I think that'll make it easier. Remember when I said you had your iPad, you're driving down the street, you see what's going on around you? What if you could also see the equity of every property around you? Which properties are on free and clear? Which ones are underwater? How much they're underwater? What if you could compare equity in El Cajon, right? You don't have to use it just when you're driving around. Move the map. There's El Cajon, there's La Jolla. Notice there's a lot more green, free and clear, and blue with equity in La Jolla than there is in El Cajon. Does that make sense? Sorry, I should have made this more local than San Diego, but hopefully that makes sense. Are there many foreclosures in this area? Well, there they all are, right around you in the map. And you could drag this map anywhere. So if you're curious about someplace else, do that. Or as you're driving down the street, go, oh, that house is in foreclosure. Oh, yeah, that one too. One of the things that I learned when I was investing, right, is you get these, you know, zip codes, these farms or whatever, right? And, and you know, now the hot new real estate tools get down to the neighborhood level. Well, one of the neighborhoods that I was interested in, I got a call and I was really excited, but it found out that the neighborhood kind of had a freeway through it. And even though it had the same name, on this side of the freeway, it was all new homes that were now all in foreclosure. On this side of the freeway was all homes that had tons of equity and people had owned them for a very long period of time. And I said, well, that's interesting, right? I wonder if I look at a city and I look at the areas where people have lived for a long time, if I couldn't find where the better areas of a city are versus the worst areas, right? Because if it's not a very good area, do people stay very long? They move out. There's higher turnover. So we built a turnover map that shows color-coded how long people have been in their properties, right? And as you start scrolling this map around and you look at different areas, you start seeing places where people have been a little while versus where people stay a long time. And it gives you a better idea of where's, where's a good place to invest, where maybe not. What about rentals? We're talking about the owner-occupied, right? Absentee owner stuff. How about if you could just see them when you're driving down the street? Oh, that one's absentee owner. That one's absentee owner. Right? It's the same data the title companies are using, that, that list you're getting. But now you see it as you're driving around. This explore mode is a big, one of the big things I wanted to do. I was just tired of not being able to visualize. You can get as many lists as you want from the title company. A list will not help you visualize what's going on in a neighborhood, what's going on in a town, et cetera. And by doing this at the parcel level, and it's not perfect, it's public records data, folks. You're going to click on some of these and go, ah, that doesn't make any sense. It's public records data. So keep that in mind. It's not perfect. But overall, each one of those read, those people reported to the county they didn't take the homeowner tax exemption, which is what every absentee owner list is based on. Now, do some people not take the $7,000 credit on their property taxes even though they live there? Occasionally, yes, you'll find that. So do remember it's public records data, and some people don't take what's given to them. But by and large, it's pretty darn helpful. <laughs> Ever wondered where the lower end and higher end neighborhoods are? Right? Does this look like a higher end neighborhood down there and maybe a little lower there? Again, just color coded. Based on an AVM, an automated valuation model, Sean and I talked about these a little earlier. AVMs, Zillow's estimates, right? Zillow made AVMs popular and kind of well known. They're based on public records data. They're often wrong. But 
If they're wrong by 10%, they still help you see differences of $100,000, $200,000, and you get an idea, a feeling for neighborhoods. If you've got somebody on the other end of the phone saying, I'm interested in selling my property, and you sent out 500 postcards, and you want to have some idea about what this person's property is like and what the neighborhood's like and all the rest, could this help you? How much mortgage debt? Where do people have a lot of mortgage debt? So there's a whole bunch of these, and we continue to, to bring out more age of the homes. Where are older homes versus newer homes? You can see new home subdivisions pop out, right, versus the old established neighborhoods. You can just see it visually swiping around. So explore mode is, is one of the things I'm really, really excited about. Like I said, if you click that little target symbol next to the search bar, That'll put it in GPS mode if you're on an iPad or an Android device. It'll even do it on your, on most PCs these days have some geo capabilities from Wi-Fi. And as you're driving around, right, especially with the iPad and Android, that map will just move and keep showing you what's new around you as you're going. So that's explore mode. It's one of um, about five new modules that we have. And uh, it's the one, though, that I'm most excited about and, uh, yeah, very happy to have uh, out. And we'll continue adding new visualizations to this. All right. Um, for a lot of investors in the crowd, a lot of people doing buy and hold, Fannie and Freddie. I love these, uh, these uh, things, you know, Fannie and Freddie, big bloated. Be a deer and catch us when you land. It's got a taxpayer at the bottom. Um, They've made it tough to get more than four loans, right? Some of them officially allow up to 10. Bruce Norris, myself, and some other investors went back um, in 2009 when there wasn't a lack of inventory and, and kind of asked Fannie um, and HUD, et cetera, to try to make it easier to do um, loans to investors. And they said, well, you know, why would we help you speculators? You're the guys that caused this problem. And I'm like, whoa, you guys are really clueless. Um, but what do you do if you can only get four loans, right? And so this comes back a little bit to what Sean was talking about earlier. Would you maybe pay a premium on the property if it came with that 3% financing deal and had good cash flow, right? I mean, he was like, God, is this worth it at 97 grand? But the payment was 300 and the rent was 1200. I'm like, shoot. Write that guy a check for 20 grand, I'm in. <laughs> I don't care. Um, so our new property search, right, when you call the title company, they will give you for free a list of absentee owners. So he also talked about properties that are free and clear. So again, we're modeling what the equity is on every single property in California, every single one. So you come in here and you say, I want 100% equity. I want free and clear properties. Zero combined loan to value. Enter that, right? You can enter a location, the geography you want. You can type in a city. You can type in a list of cities, a list of zip codes. You can draw stuff around on the map. You want to draw a line for within a mile of the coast. Do that. Now this one jumps right in and shows the list results, but I can also say, show me ones where they're not taking the homeowner deduction, um, or they're, they're, claiming, they're not claiming the homeowner deduction on the uh, property taxes, which is what most absentee owner lists are based on. You can also, and separately, the other thing sometimes I'll base ones, is where the mailing address is different than the, the other edge. And you have your choice. You can use one, the other, or both of those. We do both, right? You want to add, and where the mailing address is in Nevada or some other state, feel free to do that as well. Back to your example. You want to focus on ones of certain bedrooms or sizes, do that. right? So you can add as many of these different criteria as you want you know, and get that list down to something that is far more targeted than that same list that everybody's getting from the title company that they print off in bulk and hand out every month. And that's what our property search feature is really about. Now, when you get those results, you can pick from a whole bunch of different 
things that show up in these, these search results, like owner name, and whether or not it's their primary residence, when they bought it, what they paid for it, right? So you start to have a better picture of what's going on with that, that owner. And you can sort by any of these things. So you can sort by address or city or location or price or AVM, estimated value, et cetera. Now when you drill in to that property, either because you're gonna go knock on that door or look at it or you're really interested in this one particular property, we've got an owner search feature there. And you look at it, Google, Zaba, White Pages, Secretary of State business search, if it's a business, so you can go see who the owners of the business are, right? Um, LinkedIn works really well, at least in the Bay Area where everybody's in LinkedIn. I'm not sure down here. There's Chris, right? Or three possible tries at Chris, Mission Ave and Carmichael, right? So Sacramento area, I got three Chris's. It's probably one of those three. And um, two of them are in my network, right? Probably get an introduction to Chris. We still have two million homeowners in California who are underwater. And it frankly pisses me off that we talk about a real estate recovery with that many people underwater and that much negative equity, not only here in California, but nationwide. You know, uh, the gall of our leaders <laughs> to talk about a recovery because prices are coming back up because of an artificial constraint of supply and artificially low interest rates, right? When we still have that many people underwater is ridiculous. They're not going to fix it, right? It's going to be realtors working with those folks one at a time and letting them know, you know what, even though you're underwater and you haven't missed a payment, you can still do a short sale now. That wasn't so easy not that long ago, but you can do it now. Um, and for the investors, you know, some of those folks are only a little underwater. You know, sometimes they roll into heart financing at some ridiculous percentage forever and it's a great rental, even though they don't want to be there anymore. And even though you quote unquote overpay, at the end of the day, if you're looking for cash flow, maybe that's okay. So, um, and I would just also remind that, you know, short sales are still a pretty uh, important part of the market. So this is, the blue line here is market sales up until 05, they kind of went away. And then um, green is REOs, obviously taking up the majority of the market. But short sales is one, one portion of the market that is, is growing as well and is important. In a market that's moving up this quickly, can a short sale deal that was maybe not something I was interested in, in, in as an investor become something interesting to me as an investor over three, four, five months as they work through all the approvals? What if I could come in here and search for underwater homeowners where it's listed for sale and reach out to those realtors and find out the realtors that are doing a lot of those deals, right? And start making connections with those realtors and saying, hey, if you have a deal, especially one that's been longer, four or five, and the buyer falls out at the last minute, give me a call. So we wanna help you find those too. One of my favorite things when I was flipping was I found this little tract home in my community that was exactly 1,692 square feet. And this was really important in how I approached the design of foreclosure radar originally because that exact floor plan happened to have this roof that extended out over a whole bunch of additional square footage, right? And it was really easy to go in and pour a footing and throw the walls up, right? For like 10 grand, I could add a bunch of square footage and add about $50,000 of value to the property, you know? And so I wanted to buy all of those that I could, but you go use any of the, you know, any of the publicly facing kind of real estate tools and they always do this thing where they go zero to 500, 500 to 1,000 square feet. You can't search for 1,692 square feet, which is the floor plan that I want. It seems like a really simple thing, right? But to make searching faster, they use this thing called indexing. 
And indexing takes it down from every single foot, you know, from zero to five or 10,000 feet, right? Square footage of houses and puts it into these 10 buckets. So now I'm only searching by 10 possibilities instead of 10,000 possibilities. And so most people that do search do these things to make it simpler, make it faster. And when I launched foreclosure radar, I said, we're not doing that. It may be a little slower, right? in terms of how long it takes to search. But if it takes 10 seconds instead of one second and you can search by exactly what you want, that was an important and worthwhile trade-off in my mind. So if you found that house with that floor plan, you can search by exactly that square footage and find exactly those, those properties. It's a little thing. And then again, if they aren't in LinkedIn, you can use other sources in owner search like here's white pages and it gives you a couple listings and there's some good paid for searches in there too where it gives you phone numbers next to kin right what if it's a what if we, we look and we dial in on that property it's owned free and clear and it's you know a bad example but Fred my father's name um, and maybe you know that's not a younger person's name as much right um, and you think wow you know Maybe they passed away. And, um, you know, you can use some of these search searches to start finding next of kin. You go search Fred O'Toole, and some of these search companies give you my name and my phone number and my address, right? And uh, probate deals are good deals. This is not going into probate. Sorry, that was a little macabre. Um, <laughs> Looking for an example there, and are you are you a newer auction investor? Are you thinking about going down to the auctions? Are you tired of how tight things have gotten in your area and wondering if maybe it's better in the next county over? Um, one of the things that I really recommend you do is you do um, some paper trading first, right? And one of the things that we've always done is made it easy to go find those those deals. And I want to just take a second here, because we have quite a few foreclosure radar um, users in the room. Our foreclosure search is way better in property radar. And let me just tell you a couple reasons why. If you remember, we had pre-foreclosure, auction, bank owned, third party, and canceled, right, were the five kind of things. And then we had this search historical, where everything went to die. Problem is, is there's a lot of opportunities in that stuff, right? And so we kind of changed our model when we went to property radar. And so pre-foreclosure, we tell you why it's no longer pre-foreclosure. There was an NTS filed. It was sold, which we didn't used to do at all in foreclosure radar. So you get people who are pre-foreclosure, but it had been sold as a short sale, and you're sending them a postcard, you're wasting your money. Now we track that sale, and we now know they're sold. And then finally, after 180 days, stop bothering the poor folks. They probably got a loan mod or something. But if you want to bother them, you can go look for them in outdated. Right? You have that option. The auction properties, those are still the ones scheduled for auction. Those people have a sale date. Bank owned. In foreclosure radar, we showed the bank owned stuff for 120 days. Now we show it as bank owned until it's sold. Simple enough thing. But do you want to know how many bank owned properties there are in your zip code? Put your zip code up in the search bar. Click bank owned. That's how many bank owned properties there are right now. Whether they're in rehab or eviction, they're pending, right? Whatever, wherever they are in the stage, every single bank owned property in your area is going to be there. In public records data, sometimes there's little issues, but we, we do our best to try to go back. We look at older ones and try to clean that up. Now, here's the one I'm talking about third party, right? Every third party purchase that an investor makes down at the courthouse steps, we track. And we know a third party purchased it, not the bank. And we track when they resell them. We're also picking up, OK, they're not reselling it. They're probably holding this as a rental. You want to see what third party investors are holding rentals in your area? Check that box, third held. Get a list of all of them. See who they are. Got some rental deals you want to wholesale off? That'd be a good place to look. Check the third resold, right? And you've now got data on every single flipper. You've got what they paid for it at the auction and what they resold it for. 
Now, we won't be able to tell you how much they paid to repair it, right? Which would be nice. <laughs> but it's pretty cool. So, you know, and you get back all those results, right? So, before you look at the winning bids and you get the answer, right, take a look at the properties and kind of say, here's what I think it's worth, here's what I think it could have resold for, right? Do your homework a little bit and pencil out. Paper trade. Right? Same thing they tell you to do before you start trading stocks. Paper trade. And then go in and see what they paid. Would you have won? Would you have paid more than they did or not? Right? And then look at what they sold it for. Did they get more than you thought or less than you thought? Right? Pretty quickly you can see whether you've got a knack for this or not, and where you're maybe weak, where they might be strong, right? Where the opportunities might be, what neighborhoods maybe get a little bit more margin than what other neighborhoods where you should be focusing your time. Find the key players. Um, do you stay away from the auction um, as the deals look good but seem too risky? I don't know where this is going. Find properties that just sold at auction and purchased from the investor. Oh, to reduce risk. So here, again, what about if I go through there and search for the properties that have been purchased by auction investors. I'm looking for deals I can fix and flip. I can now see every deal they purchased. Do some of the auction investors sometimes like the wholesale deals? You know, I used to personally wholesale deals for even three, five grand. If you gave me the cash the same day I put it out at the courthouse steps, what was my return on investment? Invest, it was infinite. I never actually took the cash out of my, I just put some money in my pocket. Every once in a while, you know, there's times when I'm low on cash or whatever, and sometimes that's better. And, you know, that, that can work, especially if you've already researched that property and the rest. You don't have to be the one that goes down. And maybe you do it a day later, after you've had a chance to call the title company, have them run a real quick title search and make sure that they did their homework okay. Maybe you pay them a little bit bigger premium and buy it from them with title insurance. You really want to be safe. So search trustee sales have been sold to another investor in the last three days. Keep in mind, we track what happens down at the courthouse steps every day. So you, you can get that information up to date. Now, we won't have their name until they record the trustee's deed, which happens a couple of weeks later. But you can start doing your research and getting ready to re reach out to them. And you can review how much they paid. So you go in with information of what they paid and whether or not it makes sense to make them an offer. You do the rehab, you both win. So we talked about constrained. We'll take questions afterwards. Um, we talked about constrained supply, right? We talked about artificial demand due to low interest rates. I think one could make a pretty good argument right now that the price increases that we're seeing are artificial because of these, you know, um, this meddling in the markets, as it were, right? And so there's a, there's a really important question is, are we in a housing bubble? Is this a good time to buy, right? And I hear this a lot from folks, right? Prices are going up. How long will they continue to go up? You know, Bruce Norris, fast, furious, and dangerous. At what point is it dangerous? Will you know? Or will you be the last guy standing when they pull out the chairs? I think that's the most important question. And so this next piece is not so much about property radar but I think it's important because this is what saved me. I had 25 homes at the end of 2005, 23, somewhere in there, and decided to get out of the market and sell everything and had everything unloaded, right, by mid-2006. I had one that was a uh, meth lab that, you know, kind of beat me up a little bit. And um, they changed the rules on me. It used to be I'd go into the house, with the pressure washer. Have you ever pressure washed the inside of a house? It works good. I mean, like, really good. Pressure washer, you know, the, the, you, sometimes you get the really strong smells in a house. You pressure wash the inside. You tear out all the carpet and all the rest. You go in with kills, and you spray paint the floor, the ceiling, everything with kills, and then you start, right? And that was my standard meth lab, you know, procedure. They changed the rules 
uh, you know, sometime in 2005. I didn't get the memo. And uh, they started to do penetrative testing, where they penetrated into the drywall and into heating ducts and that kind of stuff. And they still found trace amounts of meth. And so I had to tear out all the drywall, all the HVAC, all the This was actually the last deal I got sold out of that, that period. And um, they actually, I thought for sure I could leave the toilets. They're porcelain. Uh, they actually made me replace the toilets. Uh, I think I was a little combative with the guy, maybe. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't super thrilled, especially because I could see the market going down. And of course, when I bought the house, it was, I could have sold it every day for 320, right? By the time I got it done, I got it in the escrow for 290, right? And then like a week before we're, we're supposed to close escrow, the, I get a call. The people are walking away from their deposit. They don't care. There's no way they're going to close. A sign went up down the street. Brand, this is a 30-year-old home that backs to a major thoroughfare, not a freeway, but a highway. And um, there's a sign down the street, new homes from the from the from the 290s, same price I have, brand new homes, right? And um, we knew they were building the homes and stuff. We just didn't expect them to be priced that cheaply. You walk inside, they smell like fresh baked cookies, and it's like, oh man, I'm in trouble. I actually got it sold for 260. That house today is worth eighty-five thousand dollars. So. Um, Look at that last line. Prices on are, on are a tear up, right? Look how steep that is, right? Going up, up, up. Um, you know, the blue line's California. This happened to be Sacramento. Sorry, I didn't get this updated. Um, so there's no question in my mind right now that home prices are going to continue to rise. I'm not quite as bullish as Bruce when he says a 20% increase this year. Um, we might see it. Do people understand that median price that's reported in the newspaper doesn't necessarily, if the median price says that prices have gone up 10%, do you understand that prices may not have gone up at all, that they could have gone down? How many people understand that? Okay. And, and what's, what's the reason? Anybody want to venture the, yes? Right. The mix, it's a shift in mix, right? So if you go, if you were selling all low end properties and you sell all high end properties, you'll see a shift up even if everything was going down. And I learned this because I watched it in, in some of the harder hit areas, right? They took away the subprime financing first. We saw median prices still going up, and I'm going, geez, my personal inventory is going down across the board at all price points, right? Didn't have very much left, but I had a couple, like the meth house. And I said, you know, but the median price was still going up when it when that price went from 320 to 260. And it was because the mix was shifting. And so now that said, I'm not suggesting that prices aren't rising. Prices are truly rising. But some of it is also due to mix shift, and that's becoming kind of self-reinforcing. Are we selling as many foreclosures this year as we were last year? Absolutely not. Right? The banks like to foreclose on the low-end homes. They don't like to foreclose on the high-end homes. They let those people sit and live rent-free. You know, we've got a, a guy up north who's got a $1.5 million loan, you know, on a $1.2 million house who hasn't made a payment in five years. You know, God forbid they foreclose on that used car salesman, but no offense to any used car salesman, but the guy's not a good guy and they won't foreclose on him. And yet, you know, we had another one, a trustee sale investor called me and said, Sean, I, I, this is just not right. Explain to me what's going on here. He went to go, was driving trustee sales on the way to the courthouse steps. And you know what? I'm not going to go there because this is, never mind. Sorry. It's just, it's, it's not the right story for today. Um, lack of supply and continued demand will put upward pressure on prices. But I believe they'll be a little bit more constrained. So Bruce might be right on the 20% because of the combination of mix shift plus price. 20% on price, I mean, we seem headed there. It seems like we're going to pull it off. So he may be right. But I still think it's not that easy to get loans, right? Somebody earlier stood up and said they could get the loan. But it's still people find that to be harder than it, than it was. 
appraisals are still a little harder. We had somebody else stand up and said they were good at getting appraisals. Good for you. Um, but also by affordability and ROI. One of the things that you really need to understand, right, San Bernardino, Riverside, Sacramento have been on a tear upwards because ROIs were too high. And a lot of folks missed that. And even though this is the formula I used to tell myself to get out of the market, I missed just how good the ROIs were. I wasn't sitting there calculating it in some of these places because I should have backed up the truck. We all should have, right? And it was, in hindsight, so obvious. And so really simple formula. This is what saved me in 2005. We all have been taught to look at comparables, right? I submit to you that in today's market, comparables do not matter, right? Sean's offer from that hedge fund, comparables do not matter. Hedge funds do not care about comparables. They care about yield, return on investment. And this what this more than anything else told us the, the, the market was overpriced in 2005. So I'm mean, gonna just do this really simple, right? Return on investment equals income minus expense. You've got to do that math first, then divide it by investment. I'm going to keep it really simple. You know, there's internal rate of return calculations and all kinds of crazy stuff that you, the more advanced folks, after you take Bill Tan's calculator class, you know, you can get a little more advanced. I'm going to keep it really simple right here and just recommend you take Bill Tan's calculator class. Income minus expense divided by investment. So let's just take Rent to 2,000 a month, 24,000 a year. Just to keep the math simple, $4,000 in expenses, right? If I pay 200 grand, that's $20,000 in net operating income. Divided by a $200,000 price, right, is a 10% return on investment. Now, what if I'm a hedge fund and I don't care about prices, I care about return, and I want a 7% return. Well, with a little simple math, I just flip that equation around and I say, well, my investment, what I'm willing to pay is equal to that 20 grand divided by my ROI, right? So 20 grand divided by 10% equals 200 grand. And a lot of the hedge funds went out with a target of 7% in San Bernardino, Riverside, Sacramento, right? And a lot of times they found prices, even just buying stuff off the MLS, were significantly below that. And they backed up the truck, just like all of us should have done. Right? So now look at what happens here. At 10%, the house is worth 200000 You had ROIs at 10% better in a lot of these places. At 7%, it takes it from 200000 to 285000 that's a pretty big increase in prices. Does it make sense why that blue line's been on a tear upwards? We overcorrected, not everywhere. And I guess this is, you know, Sean mentioned Bruce and I occasionally, you know, differ, right? He's out there seeing a 20% increase in price in California. Prices are pretty high in the Bay Area. Prices are pretty high in, you know, so, some areas, right? Prices overcorrected in other areas. So we may see that in the median for California, but does that mean that, you know, if you own a house in, what's a higher end area around here that's pretty high prices? Okay, Dakota, Dakota de Casa. If you own a house in there, should you expect a 20% increase? My guess is if you compare to rents in the Bay Area right now, it's not unusual to see the ROI be 2 or 3%. Now that may be a good investment when the Fed has rates at zero and you work for Google and it's money's free right now, but two or three percent is not very good, especially for kind of a beat up house in San Jose, which is what we're talking about. And I think if we did the math in different areas around here, which I usually try to do before these meetings, so again, I apologize because I, I did not do as much homework as I would have liked, um, then I think you'll find that there's some areas right now that are probably overpriced. You should probably not back up the truck, right? So this math, to me, 
is really important. And if you do this math, it's going to be the difference between whether this year is dangerous or profitable. So please stop worrying about comps. Comps matter if you're a flipper. If I'm going to sell the house in 90 days, it doesn't matter what the ROI is. It matters what the comps are, what's happening right now today, and who I've got to compete with in listings. But if I'm holding, am I making a good investment or not? Depends a lot on this ROI. The next thing I will say, should I expect the same ROI? So 7% is their target ROI. Should I expect that to be the same in Pacific Palisades as in Compton? Did I do a little better that time? <laughs> Much better. So should I expect the same ROI in those two places, right? If there's a chance I'm going to get killed in a drive-by shooting, I want a better than 10% ROI, right? If I'm buying a, a legacy property for my family or just because I want to buy something badass because I have a big ego, I don't care about ROI, right? And so you've got to weigh that, especially for the flippers, right? You may see deals that are great flips that make zero sense. I just say to you on those, move fast before those folks realize that it's not a great ROI and prices change. Because they will change, even in Malibu, even in the Bay Area, even in Pacific Palisades. There's still cycles. I'm going to say, what's that? In Northern California, I've, he and I have had this discussion. He's talking about California median. He, he, I think he agrees. I won't put words in his mouth, but it's not going to be the same everywhere for sure. But some people misinterpret the headlines and the, the sound bites. And so I just like to touch on this, not, not to pick a fight with Bruce. Bruce is great. I love Bruce. So it's not about that at all. Um, so please do this. Start thinking about you know, your real estate investments in terms of ROI. This is also more simply called cap rate, capitalization rate. People say, well, what about financing? Right? I had a woman after a real estate investment club, and I, and I came up, and she says, you know, I've got a property. I bought it at trustee sale for 285 or 280 It's now worth 385 I just refinanced it. I got every penny that I put in back out. So she basically financed $280,000. She's got $200 a month of positive income in it after the refi, right? So what are, what are her cash on cash returns? The cash on cash returns is the same thing, but we just income minus expenses minus financing, or minus payment, and investment minus financing. That's a cash on cash return, right? Her cash on cash returns are Infinite. They're awesome. Take Bill Tan's calculator class. But when she does the cap rate math on that same price based on the rents and the expenses and all the rest, it was a 2.5% or three, a little under 3% return. Right? And so she's got infinite cash flow. There's a lot of cash flow investors that will tell you, hey, if it cash flows, who cares? Keep it, you know, whatever. But in my mind, it's like, okay, well, if you're going to carry $280,000 of debt, which is risk, are you better off carrying it in a place that not only gives you infinite cash flow, because you're going to use that same $280,000 of debt somewhere else, but also is more like at a seven cap? And okay, you're not going to do it in San Jose. You're going to have to drive a little bit farther to East County or something, but isn't that fundamentally a better long-term investment if you have to choose between two? and you can reuse that cash. I don't think it is just cash flow. I think you still want to use this capitalization rate too, you know, and make the best deals that you can thinking through both. Um, you know, another thing to do, especially if you're a realtor in the room, think through every rental price point, map that using currently available loan, right, into a home price. So if somebody's paying $1,000 of rent, they can afford a $220,000 home. That's basically $1,000 as principal, interest, taxes, and insurance on 220 grand, assuming they can come up with a down payment. So you can kind of think about you know, what changes in rents due to price as well. It's another way. It's basically the same math, but it's 
was just an interesting way to be thinking about the market. I think rent comps in this market are far more important than sales comps. With that in mind, if prices are rising, little test here, think about this equation. As prices rise, what happens to ROI? It goes down. Are prices rising right now? So if you want to buy rentals, what do you need to do? Pull your head out. Don't think about doing it tomorrow. Every day you wait, you're getting less return on investment. Right? You should have a sense of urgency right now, in my mind. If you follow the stock market and its gyrations, lots of positive news there lately, right? Woohoo! We're back up to where we were in 2000. Uh, and we're at price earnings ratios that are kind of at a peak, right? What if those correct to the long term norm? It's pretty ugly. I don't own a single stock. I want decent returns on my money. I am personally putting my money into real estate as fast as I can. And uh, I would suggest sooner is better than later. Only hesitation I have about that, we are in unprecedented times. China has a huge bubble and unprecedented levels of debt. Japan right, has debt levels at 2x GDP. Um, the US, certainly, we've expanded our balance sheets in, in ways that were hard to imagine. Some said were impossible. The euro's in trouble, right? We are in unprecedented times. We have new types of tax and threats that nobody thought about before, right? This is probably the Bitcoin uh, presentation, which I'm sorry I missed earlier, but yeah. Yeah, awesome. And um, we're in unusual times for sure. And I would you know, highly recommend that even for those flippers, if you can occasionally do a deal where you get to hold, I, I think it's gonna be a really important store of, of value. And kind of no matter what happens and how this all works out from the best case, you know, to the worst case where your renters have to pay in chickens if you own real estate, at least you're getting chickens, right? I mean, no matter what that range of, of problems is. So just remember the black swan. Things are changing. And Nassim Taleb wrote this book. I recommend you read it. It basically um, presents the notion that 9-11, um, Black Friday, those types of things are not the exception. They're the norm. The only thing that's exceptional is that we think they'll never happen again, right? To think we'll never have something like a 9-11 or a Black Friday or those types of things ever happen again is unrealistic, right? So be careful in your real estate investing not to take on too much debt, to keep some cash reserves, right? Use your head. I think it's a good time to get out there and make it happen right now. I mean, think about all the years there where you couldn't, buy real estate on a whole basis in California. You had to go to places like Texas. You know, Even though the hedge funds and everybody in there and prices are going up, you can still find 10% ROI deals if you're good at looking like Sean is in California. Not that far from where you live probably. I always love these guys that run off to Texas and drive right past that boarded up house that's down the street that they could have got the same returns or better on without having to fly all over the place. And, you know, so I think the time is good, but I just still exercise some caution and, and ask yourselves the what ifs, because if you do, then you'll be ready if something does, does happen. Um, property radar is partially out. We've got foreclosure search, we've got trustee sale search, we've got property search, and we've got explore mode, the cool maps I showed you earlier. Right, and right now those are forty nine ninety five a month. We do have we with the with property radar we're going to have three price points forty nine fifty nine and ninety nine. We don't have all the modules for these two out yet. So right now we're giving you some of the modules that are included in these for free in the forty nine 
package. Hopefully that makes sense. It's way more complicated than I wanted it to be. I wanted it all out at the same time, but felt it was better to get out what we had and get started. Um, if you're a foreclosure radar customer, Property Radar is a separate product. You can use it free right now until June 15th. When you log in, it's going to ask for your contact information because it, we're putting all that into a new database. And, um, and then you have a choice of, of three things. You can continue to use it free until June 15th and just say not yet. You can switch, cancel your foreclosure radar account and go to a property radar account. And most of the features are there. The big things that are missing are team accounts and alerts. Um, and then um, the third option is you can add the property radar account. So you keep your foreclosure radar account and add a property radar account, which obviously you don't need to do until the 15th. And uh, that's out now. For those folks who aren't foreclosure radar customers, um, you can get a free three-day trial of property radar. Obviously, for the foreclosure radar customers, you get more than three days. So use, use, use your same username and password to log in and get until June 15th. So hopefully that makes sense. And hopefully you'll give it a try. I think it's a great farming tool, especially for those of you doing mailers or door knocking or those kinds of things. Plus, I think it gives you some really great visuals on what areas uh, are good to be in. That's, that's what I've got. Questions about the property radar product. I want you to go ahead, write them down. Stand up, Angel. Write them down, hand them to Angel. The reason I want to do this is I want to read them so we can get them clearly on the audio and on the video, and I'll have Sean answer them. If that's okay with you guys. We'll go through those questions, and then I want to just do a few clarifications with Sean about um, about you know being an investor, not just using property radar, but strategies that he's he's used, he is using, and what some of the other investors are doing. So if you have specific questions about the property radar product, write them down uh, and get them to Angel. Hold it up so she knows you've got one. I want to make sure you guys understand something. We're, we are Property Radar subscribers. We don't pay Sean to be here. Sean doesn't pay us to speak to you. The only people we're ever going to put in front of you are people whose products we use and we know work. Okay? So you guys have to understand that that's the way that Investors Workshops runs. We're, we don't take money. It's not a pay-to-play type of thing. So. Uh, if you have issues with support, Sean will support you and his team will support you. Does that make sense? Okay. Really cool stuff. Sean, I like your... <laughs> We're using it too, so I was like, man, I didn't know I did all that stuff. <laughs> you know, one of the most crazy things with even with foreclosure radar is, um, you know, we've documented somewhere I think around 100 different use ways to use the software. And almost everybody I talk to uses a maximum of two. Right. Right? They, they do their one thing. They do it over and over. It works for them. And that's great. And I'm totally happy. If I can do one thing for you that saves you more than $49.95 worth of your time, you know, that's my goal. You know, my goal, I'm in the public records business. Public records suck. They're right. not very good. Right. But there's a lot of gold in those hills, even though the data is not great. And if I can make it easier for you to get, and I can save you more than forty nine ninety five, you know, a month worth of your time, that's my goal. Well, I can tell you right now. I mean, I will, I will hands down say, the number one thing that any investor should be doing, and I don't care how you buy, you got to be looking direct to sellers. And the way that you can sort on your site is, it's definitely going to save us more than forty nine dollars a month. I mean, you know, think about it. If you guys do one deal. And if you just did what Sean did and you sold it for 3000 bucks at the steps and you'd spent a year of your service, do you think it was worth uh, 700 600 700 bucks? I think it was probably worth it. All right, so this one says, does Property Radar work with multi-units and commercial property? Yeah, so we have every property. There are a couple of things in there um, that you need to be aware of. We don't have um, a valuation model or... Um, the commercial stuff. So what we do is we plug in just the assessed value, which if they bought it a long time ago is going to be really low. So when you look at commercial stuff, you're going to see a lot of estimated values that are too low, right? So there are some things that um, we're able to do around single family with a little bit more uh, modeling that we can't do for some of those things. But we absolutely have every information on every property. If you click 
you pull out your iPad right now and you click on this building, you can see who owns this building, how much debt they have on the building, the transaction history of, you know, when they got that debt, when they purchased it, all the rest. And really, in commercial, they really should be looking at NOIs and really should be looking on an income basis because, I mean, if you guys aren't familiar with commercial, please don't go buy commercial buildings thinking you're going to flip a commercial <laughs> building. Please don't do that. When will alerts be added? I have flipped three. Well, don't, now you just make me say, don't do uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I think with everything, it's like, you know, there, there's always can, opportunities. But... So, like, I, for example, I found a 40,000 square foot um, uh, warehouse building. Sorry, I don't mean to pick no. on you here, but I'm just saying th there's opportunity everywhere, right? Like, if you're not finding an opportunity, keep trying something new because there's opportunity areas. Anyways, 40,000 square foot, but it's four buildings of 10,000 square foot each, right? And it was for sale ridiculously cheap, you know, because there just aren't, for older buildings like this is more owner user, but 40,000 is too big for owner user. They want yeah. 10. And everybody goes down to the county and it's advertised in LoopNet. This one is actually just off LoopNet. <laughs> it's advertised in LoopNet as this property cannot be split. And I said, well, okay, but let me just check that. And I went down and I dug through the county records and I found an old subdivision map for the property that had four parcels. And so I didn't have to split it, it was already split. All I had to do was a lot line adjustment, which the county couldn't do anything about. And I sold four 10,000 square foot owner user properties and doubled my money. Yeah, so that wasn't just find it, okay. See, I, if he can say that and he clarifies it, I'm just telling you guys, listen, there's always niches and I highly recommend you guys can specialize when you can. But uh, you know, your, your, your property radar is like, you know, here, I'll go back on you for a minute. It's like a loaded gun. There's a lot of stuff on there. Do me a favor, check with somebody. Call Bill Tan, raise your hand, Bill. Call Bill Tan, run something past Bill, would you? You know, run past something past Jim. Raise your hand, Jim Tusco. You know, these guys have been in business a little while, and they've seen a few things. I mean, heck, you'll never that, reach them, but call Sean. But that, that, that's a really important point, though, because things like, we'll say this is a first and this is a second. Right. But we're doing that off of a computer model, right? And that computer model is based on that most people don't pay off their loan very much when they refinance. They'll pay it down 10 or 20%, but they don't pay it down 50%. Right? Well, my economist, right, who's worried about the economy and some of these things, she paid down her loan 50%. Well, that new loan we model as a second, right? Because it's a much smaller loan after what appears to be a first. So we actually show her being underwater when actually she only has the second loan, right? So you, you really do, when he says, go check if you're not sure, really go check. It's model, right? We're trying to help you focus in. The goal there of modeling those loans is if there's 5,000 properties that meet your criteria, you can't knock on every one of those doors. So why not use our guess at which ones only have a first mortgage or have no mortgage or whatever to narrow that list down to 50 doors that you can knock and your time's going to be far better spent than if you just randomly picked 50. It's like a metal detector. It's going to beep, and it's not always going to be a gold coin, but you dig anyway, check it. Yep. When will alerts be added like you have on foreclosure radar? Um, the goal is to have all the rest of the functionality out by September 1. Um, transfer search will be the next one um, that will get out hopefully within a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, then listings, then comparables, um, and then probably alerts. This one says, do you have a rent comp feature? Yeah, so we're, we're working on that. Um, it's been really hard to find decent rental data, and that's really been the challenge. I think we've got some okay rental data that I'm excited to add, and we're just actually uh, incorporating that right now. That actually be part of our listings uh, search feature, so you'll not only be able to search for, for um, listed homes for sale, but also rental listings. And out of that, once we have that listings data, then we're planning to build a, a rental estimate. Uh, right now, we do have HUD fair market rents. I saw which that. Which is what Section 8 will pay on the property. So it's a good starting point, right? Um, it's kind of going to be at the low end, right, what Section 8 will pay, but it is, um, they try to keep it at least reasonable enough. How, that do, they how many of you guys people. do Section 8? Raise your hand do Section 8 stuff. Yeah. So we do have the HUD fair market rent data, which is the Section 8 data in there. 
Uh, does property and you can search search on it too. Cool. Does property radar do everything that foreclosure radar does? Um, with those exceptions, right now of team accounts and alerts, yes, and some more things. We've added more search criteria. You know, so for example, um, for those folks that go down to the courthouse steps, if you do a trustee sale search, it brings back the whole calendar. If you're on a cell phone or, or a cellular connection, that can be pretty slow. Now you can say only return only return those things that are actively scheduled for sale, so you get your results back quicker and you can get updates faster. Um, you can also say only give me the ones for 1030 sales or for sales at a certain location, which foreclosure radar didn't have. So there's, there's a bunch of new stuff even within foreclosure radar or foreclosure search and trustee sales search. I was seeing some current foreclosure radar users back there kind of drooling over <laughs> the new features. That's no lie. Wipe your mouths, guys. It's kind of good stuff. Is property radar only for California? It is only for California at this time. We did support, um, with foreclosure radar, we still support Arizona, Nevada, Washington, Oregon, and um, just uh, there's a lot of new data um, and a lot of new costs. And so I got to roll it out here first and hopefully uh, some folks subscribe and I can use that subscription money to go buy data in the next one and keep moving on. Now data is very expensive. We were talking yeah. about that at dinner. I mean, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars per month for county if you want to own that data. Yeah, it adds up very, very quickly. And I mean, there are, we go get some of the data ourselves, mm -hmm. and then we buy the data from others, and you can buy it from, you know, the big title companies do have some bulk sales departments. Um, you know, but you get, you go to them and you get something like Alameda County, where they're typically a month behind and the trustee sales happened. Already. <laughs> before they have it out. And, you know, even that's still a struggle. We've had a real problem with San Francisco. You know, the county recorder there wrote a treatise, treatise, is that the right way to say yeah. that? You know, saying that every foreclosure was illegal. It, he's a nut. You know, it's San Francisco. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, and so, but he's not getting his stuff recorded until a month after the fact. Nobody can get it, right? It doesn't matter if you go down in the office. We're working through that, but um, it, it's a struggle getting all the data. Uh, it says, can I attach a contract to a property and property radar? Yeah, absolutely. Down in the property details page, there's a few things. There's a photo section. If you're on your iPad or your Google Android device, just click the, the camera button, and you can take the picture and add the pictures right there in, and it stores them, saves them in our server, and then when you're back in your office, they'll, they'll pop up. There's also a section called files, and you can just upload any files you want and uh, attach them. You so can I, can be standing, I can be standing in front of a house I'm interested in, take a picture with my tablet, yep. and then tag it, and then go back. It, it automatically gets saved with that property, and, and it automatically gets saved. There's a dashboard feature that shows you how many properties that you have that have photos. You can click on that and see every property that you've ever taken a photo with. You can add a tag for, you know, hey, it's a possible flip or whatever, and then you can go see all of the possible flips that have photos. Um, you're thinking about sending somebody out to take photos of properties you're interested in, search for um, all the properties where it's a possible flip, the status is needs photos and it doesn't yet have photos. So you know we try to build in a lot of that kind of workflow stuff so that it can be your system. And, of and you have some investors that use property radar to manage their whole workflow, their whole office. Yeah. Yeah, I've got one guy who's been averaging five to ten million dollars a year in profit. He needed to up his bill. Probably. Yeah, okay. he pays us two hundred and fifty dollars a month and says we're the only software he uses to run his company. That ah, sounds good. That's okay. What? So run I think, his acquisition side of his company. Not I think we a, this one. Is, I think we covered it, but I'll, I'll say it again. What does foreclosure radar have that property radar doesn't have? And you're saying right now. So right now, it's the the team accounts, okay. which we're working hard to get added, and the alerts would be the two main things. We are making some changes to to. Um, exports so um, we've kind of had this wishy-washy interesting policy on exports but exports cost us and so we're we're fixing we're changing that so exports are a little different and they're a little broken right now and uh, we're working really hard to fix that quickly so if you want to export to an Excel spreadsheet because you don't like our mailing labels you want to create your own be just a little bit patient with us on that we're trying to get it fixed quickly so if, if you may not want to switch from foreclosure radar to property radar if you need the export feature. And this one kind of ties into that. This one Maybe asks, a week. 
if I have specific searches already in foreclosure radar, will it transfer over yeah. to property radar? We bring across all your safe searches. That happens one time. Okay. Um, your safe properties, though, will go both ways. So as you save properties in one or the other, they'll show up in both. There's some features in property radar that foreclosure radar doesn't have. So if you use those features in property radar, of course, those things won't show up in foreclosure radar. But all of your safe properties will go back and forth. On the NOD list, how many days after filing does property radar post it to the site? So it's asking property radar versus county recorder. Um, four days to 25, you know, in a little county like Alpine or Mono, you okay. know, that kind of thing. So it, it, it takes about, we've got to get the image from the county. We've got to have it abstracted and then entered into our system and the rest. And so, and it depends on the county. It's really county dependent and it's a constant battle with the, the counties, um, San Francisco, Alameda, San Bernardino, we had a bunch of trouble with this year, um, too. And I think we've, I think that's better now, but um, it's, it's a fight. Uh, can you sift out 15-year mortgages with seven years remaining with contact info? Um, you said there was a hundred Yeah, ways. loan date, record <laughs> date, yeah. So the, at 15 years, you're going to start running into the fact, um, depends on the area, how far back we can get data. You know, a, a, the, the big companies that abstract the data don't necessarily abstract back far enough, or at least from the providers we've been able to get data from. So we pretty reliably have data back to 2000. And as you go back from that, I mean, I've got some recorded documents back to, you know, the early 1900s, 1913 and stuff like that. But it, it's less and less complete as you go back from 2000. So at 15 years, it's really going to depend on your area and what we could get from the uh, recorder. And being statewide, and I mean, you're bringing up a good point. When you're talking statewide, there's some of these little smaller counties and difficult counties in San Francisco where, you know, some of it is just, un, you know, unobtainium type of stuff <laughs> yeah. or super hard obtainium. Or just not cost-effective yeah. obtainium. Exactly. Yeah. They probably, and it probably wouldn't be cost effective for you to market there well, at, you know, at that, because you probably already know they probably grew up there, probably have family there, and it probably at that point, I would suggest it makes more sense for you to go down and do a little social engineering with like the county clerk or something. Right. Like Using that. public records data certainly isn't the only way to find a deal. And right. Yeah, there are other things, but you know, the, certainly the last 10 years, I think we're pretty solid. All right, this was a shout out to your staff. Patrice is awesome in support. <laughs> That's great. And have you fixed the percentage of equity CLTV connection? Cannot have percentage of equity without an auto populate CLTV percentage. I Sounds like a very specific. <laughs> I don't know. Um, That's Cheryl asking that question. Cheryl. Um, CLTV and equity are tied together. So, you know, because they're the, they're the same thing, right? If you have 50% equity, then you've got a combined loan to value of 50%, right? So those two right, things are you. tied together. But you should be able to just type in any value into those fields and have them work. So. They're the same value. There's actually only one field in our database. We're, 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 we're actually, by doing that, there's a few things. Like, we tie... Um, lot size. In lot size, you can enter it in square foot or you can enter it into acres. But if you enter it into acres, it automatically enters it into square footage. Same thing with CLTV and equity percentage. It's the same thing, right? So if you have 50% combined loan to value, you have 50% equity. And so it's, it's one of these things where I said, let's actually show that when you type it in here, have it show over here because it's also a, you know, a, teaching, a teaching moment, right? So, um, so that, that, that's on purpose, but, but it's, you're, not, you're not limiting any results because they are truly the same thing and it's the same search field in our database. It's just two ways of asking the same question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> Patrice is awesome. That's what we all know now. I don't use team accounts or alerts in foreclosure radar. Should I switch to property radar today? Um, I'd say if you use exports, check in with my support team and make sure that the bug in exports is fixed first, or maybe go try it and see if exports works well enough for you. 
Um, because they can use it free right now to check it. They can use it free right now. If exports comes up and tries to charge you, even though you're only ordering, there's a problem with our new billing system and that sometimes it thinks you get a certain number of exports for free and then after that you have to pay for them. Okay. And um, sometimes right now, even though you're just trying to export 100 records or something and it's well within your limits of what free, occasionally it's saying, hey, you've got to pay. And it's, it's a problem in our billing system. They know about it. They're working to okay. fix it. We just found out about it this last week. Okay, there's three questions here. Uh, Property Radar doesn't have the iPhone app yet, so should I stick with Foreclosure Radar while driving for dollars? Um, get, a, get an iPad or an Android tablet. And get away, way more information. Okay. That would be my number one suggestion. Then it says if you so. Know, you probably even, you know, some of the newer iPad phones, the problem is we're getting a lot of information on the screen. So on a phone, it really needs to be, you know, on a tablet, it's 1024 by 768, which is what every computer was not that long ago in terms of screen size, right? And so we can get a lot of information on 1024 by 768, and that's kind of the size we optimized for to try to make things fit well within. So you get the full experience on a tablet. As you go to the phone, it's just really hard to put all of those features in a way that's usable. And so we're still working our designs for that. You know, Foreclosure Radar's iPhone app doesn't have nearly the features that the main Foreclosure Radar app has. So um, we will have a, a phone app at some point, but, uh, but right now. And some of these new bigger the Android are, phones, yeah. you know, you may be able to get enough resolution that you're okay with it. I haven't tried that myself yet, but you might just go into the store and load our app and see what it looks like. Don't hit remember me on your password. This says, can you extract mailing list data from Property Radar? Yeah, that's the export feature, absolutely. And we include the owner name and information. And yeah, you can do a mail merge um, there, et cetera, for sure. And this one is not Property Radar specific. It's kind of market. So yeah. So I'll, I wanted to close out with some market questions. For you just, just by a show of hands for um, landlords out there, when was the last time you guys sent out a, uh, a rent increase letter? Anybody sent out a rent increase letter? You know, uh, you say, yeah, just raise your hand if you've done a rent increase letter as a landlord. Okay, put your hands down. Now, when was the last time you sent out a rent decrease letter? I want to see those hands too. Nobody's done that? To, just to, to tag along on what Sean has said about backing up and loading up on properties, one of the charts I haven't seen, and I just draw it myself, is I go back and I look at historic rents where they were. You know, go back to when we slumped. When did we slump in California? When was the big, oh my gosh, that hurt? Depends on the location. Exactly. I'm asking 2006 to 2008. So there's a range between six and eight that we feel like, oh man, I wish I could have loaded up then. If you looked at what you, oh. your rents were then and what you could have bought for, and you look at what the rents are now, the rents have not dropped from 06 to 08. They've either stayed the same, which is the worst you get, or they've gone up. But what has gone up is the price you have to pay for that. Does that make sense? So, uh, Tagging on what Sean said, if you're going to buy right now and you're going to be a flipper, I like you said, be fast. Yep. Be very fast. So this, Turns, you know, there's uh, grocery stores and retail stores. The the most important metric they have, right? Grocery stores work on very small margins, but they have very high turn on inventory. So if they have X number of dollars in their store. Right? They may only make two, three, four, five percent, but if they flip that inventory a whole bunch of times over the course of the year, they've made very high returns. And this is one of those like core things that it, uh, investors miss all the time, right? Um, you know, they take a, maybe they'll take longer and do bigger rehabs and that kind of stuff. You take that three grand at the steps, your returns are actually higher, and if you do more of those, you can actually make more money. And it, but again, it's that turns on inventory. So just, you know, really simple math. If I make 10% on a deal, right, and I do that in six months, I make 20% a year. If I do it in three months, I make 40% a year, right, on my capital. And we all have, you know, I don't care who you are, there's still some limit to the amount of capital you can put to work. Even if you have more, you can only put so much to work. So the, the key is to maximize those returns, and it's done two ways, by maximizing the return on a specific deal and maximizing minimizing the time in which you do it. And you think what happens is, you know, in your experience too, and, and again, you, you've got a lot of subscribers and you, you've got a lot of stories that I know you can tell and, and others that you won't tell. 
Uh, it's most just, of them. Yeah, no, I get it, and, and and you know we appreciate that too. I just didn't want to go down a death note uh, no, anymore. I, uh, earlier. I think if I had to if I had to gauge uh, the the attendance at the workshops and at the the seminars I go to, there's always a group of people that'll say, "But Sean, I don't have enough money to hold it. I have to flip everything because I can't keep my money tied up in there." Yeah. But, Let's speak to how low the interest rates are, because we, yeah, we've seen a, the prices are going up, and we know that that's manufactured. But you know, the people that you know that that have been buying at the trustee sales when they're holding, okay, how how have they how have they been leveraging themselves? Have they been going out and getting long-term financing, or you know, still the most of the trustee sale investors are flippers, right? Okay. You know, the exceptions are the hedge funds, right? The first one that really started holding was Waypoint up in Northern California. You know, and there's certainly others. There's some, I know there's a couple down here that do it, and they do a certain percentage they hold and the rest. Um, but I'd say the vast majority have been, you know, flippers. And that was, that was what I did. I flipped all my uh, properties. I, in fact, I never even really thought about holding, and I was buying and flipping um, for income. And even though I knew this math, and that math got me out of the market, because thinking about, you know, it really hit me when I had a... Um, a friend who bought a house in our little, my little hometown at the time of Discovery Bay, and uh, you know, he said, "Hey, I just, I just got a good deal on this property. It's you know, twenty thousand dollars less than whatever, and I'm buying it as an investment." And I'm like, "Why?" And he says, "Well, because property there has been going up a hundred thousand dollars a year. You know, why would I not want that?" And I said, well, yeah, okay, well, let's do the math real quick. And we did the math, and it was a 1.5% return on investment. At the time, returns on treasuries were higher. Right? I'm like, dude, put your money in treasuries. Why, you know, don't, you don't want to do this. And he goes, but, you know, it's okay, because I'm going to make it up on appreciation. It goes up $100,000 every year. But to go up $100,000, that ROI has to go down. Exactly. Right? And, um, my dad was a philosophy professor, and he calls that the greater fool theory. Right? You got to find somebody dumber than you to buy it for that hundred thousand dollars more. And um, you know, the greater fool theory works for a while, but you don't want to be the last one standing. You may find out you're the greatest fool, as my friend did. Well, so that's what this question says. Okay, Sean, put, get your crystal ball out. How long will property values go up? We're in an artificial world right now. Black swan. Yeah, back to my dad, which I've been thinking about a lot, obviously. You know, he said we couldn't keep running deficits forever. We're running bigger deficits than we ever have. Right. You know, how much longer can that go on? Anybody in this room think they have an answer? I, I, <laughs> that's a reasonable answer. So You got a reasonable from Sean. Good job. That was a yeah. gold star. <laughs> Yeah, please. Yeah. Yay for Jim. Making more money than any other way. I, I had one of those, so just to I'll validate that's your like point. That's like the 0.05 mirror, right? It came back, and it's like, oh, that's what we were doing in 05. Thank God I fell out. No, I, I had a guy. <laughs> I had a guy, you know, day before eviction, declare bankruptcy, right? And so it gets a stay on the eviction. Right. And... Um, you know, we go all the way through the eviction process, get the motion for, for relief, all the rest, get back. Day before eviction, he cancels that bankruptcy and refiles bankruptcy. Right? And he, he drug me out a year. Wow. The judge banned him from ever declaring bankruptcy again. <laughs> I mean, that, that the judge got so pissed at the end, he said, you have lost your right to ever declare bankruptcy again. I don't even know if that's legal. I know, I was going to say. You know, he, no more. <laughs> you're, you're, you've taken advantage of this too many times. You're out. No more. And um, 
So it took a year to get the guy out, and um, it was one of my highest returns that I had because during that year the property went way up in value. I guess the you know still the the question there is right: Is it going up faster than if you put that money back to work? And that depends on what current returns you're getting and a bunch of other variables that do take in you know time is a factor, right? If you go from 20% in three months to 30% in a year, right, you lost money. You got more money on that particular deal, no question, but is it more money than if you put that money back to work? You know, it's simple math to figure out. And you'd have to figure that out based on your returns and whether or not you could have put that money back to work and something else. Yeah. Right. And I, and I think, I think yeah. you know, Jim and, and, and other experienced flippers like Jim, you know, they never got out of the market. And when it says, when, when do you get out of the market? You, they never get all the way out. They might retrace, retrace a little bit, wait, get on the sideline for a minute. But, you know, Jim has been grinding it and grinding it. And then when you see this opportunity, because I think it's important to know when you're in the market, that's when you can feel these shifts happen faster than right. anybody else because you never left the market. You're, you know, you start, the calls start to come faster, right, Jim? The offers are more frequent. They're a little higher. And you're like, hey, uh, What's kind of happening here? I think it's much harder for the investor that's just getting in now, right? If you look now, it looks great. Rates are low, prices are rising. You're thinking, like your buddy, well, why wouldn't I buy this thing right now? Um, there's a balance there, though, because, I mean, I know a lot of 20-year-plus professional investors who lost their ass in oh, yeah. 2007. Yeah, they get so, voted off the island. Anybody get... <laughs> you know, uh, especially in Northern California where we didn't right. have Bruce running around saying, get out, get out. Oh, so, he was saying it. They just weren't listening. I don't think they weren't listening down here either. <laughs> no, I hear no, you. I know. So again, this this question, this last one is uh, well. One of them says, "How long will this is again get your crystal ball out? How long will interest rates remain low?" I I personally think you know through at least mid 2015, despite some of this, you know I think there's an important quote to remember. And every time I bring up this quote, I say I need to go figure out who said it. But um, one of the ex-Fed chairmen said it's not the job of the Fed to tell the truth. It's the job of the Fed to maintain low unemployment right, and low inflation. And, um, and I, I don't even think that's the truth because I think you know, a big part of what the Fed's trying to do right now is have people believe that there's low inflation, to keep interest rates low, to keep our debt payments manageable while creating as much possible inflation as they can to reduce the debt, right? So that's their job right now is to lie to us, convince us to give them their money for almost nothing. And, you know, um, while, while they do the best they can to see food prices and everything else go up and ultimately lower that, that debt, which is why one of the primary reasons I believe in investing in real estate is I think it's a good inflation hedge. Yeah, because they will give you chickens or cars or other things to pay their rent, right? And, they, they, and that, people that have historically, good times or bad, have paid a certain percentage of their income, right? And ultimately, incomes at inflation adjust. They haven't been keeping up very well the last, you know, um, 20 years, but ultimately, our income, other income, you know, yeah, I mean, incomes, inflation adjusted have not been, um, you know, have been declining, if anything. So, so you say maybe mid-2015 before you see any really... I, I don't... The, the problem with raising rates is we have more debt as a country than we've ever had before. If you raise rates, the payments on that debt go up. How do they raise rates without bankrupting the com country? I don't see any possible way that they can raise rates. I don't know that there's ever a possible way that they can raise rates outside of some sort of big... Blow up. Well, that's the thing too. We see with price increases, with rates low and price going up, there is a ceiling. You can't have people continue to borrow, even if it's low. It can't get any lower. Well, I guess it could get lower, but at some point, the percentage of money that people are willing to throw at their housing payment, as we saw in the previous high, it was incredibly ridiculous how much they were willing to throw. Eventually, that's going to yeah, peak that's, it. That's an interesting point, though, right? So we saw. Um, median price go from 250 to 550 from 2000 to 2008 in right. California, right, or 2007. And the interesting thing about that is if you take the most aggressive loan program for each year, 
payment did not change over that entire period of time, right? Because the first year you had the Fed lowering interest rates to save us from the dot-com bubble, right? And as interest rates go lower, you can afford to pay more for a house. Do you get more for that house? No, because everybody can afford to pay more, so prices just go up. And then we get the 5-1 interest only arm, which you weren't cool if you didn't have a 5-1 interest only arm, right. right? Which allowed you to pay more for a house. Did you get more house? No, prices just went up. And that perfectly explains all the way up to a pay option arm. You take median income in California and it perfectly tracks median price using the most aggressive. So if you take the $55,000 median income in 2006 and you put somebody into a pay option arm with a teaser rate, they can afford a $550,000 house. And that's what our median price was. We didn't have, right, a bubble in California. Not, not of buyers. Buyers did what they always did. They bought as much house as their banker told afford. them they could afford. Right? But, I mean, we had a credit bubble. It wasn't a housing bubble. Right? It wasn't, did some people go crazy and pay way too much for houses and, you know, put all their savings in, you know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's no question that some people were, Got you know, their dream Robert home Schiller's they always wanted, yeah, sure. They just irrational wanted. exuberance, right? But overall, that's not the market. The irrational exuberance was all on Wall Street. And it was all because in 2000, we let them play games with other people's money where oh, they had no more risk. Right. And they transferred all the risk to taxpayers. And we haven't fixed a single one of those rules. You guys feel good about that? You just feel like that feels good? Having all that risk, doesn't it? Doesn't it make you feel good? You know, think about it. In, in 2005, we shouldn't have been making anybody a loan at those prices, okay. right? But we were making pulse loans. Okay, at 2009, we would barely make anyone a loan. And we could have given out pulse loans, and every single loan would have been fine. No losses. Right? How could we get this more backwards? I mean, it's so basic. It's like, who runs this Because show? the government was in charge. There you go. And, and Wall Street was, you know, running it. So the last question is, when to get out of the market using ROI, they're saying, if it drops less than five, would, would that be a good indicator that you should stop buying real estate that, has, you know, has a less If you're than flipping five? in Malibu, less than five is not the right number. If you're flipping in Compton, yes, it's the right number. <laughs> or something higher. Right? You're going to have to do a little bit of that homework yourself. I can't tell you zip code by zip code, neighborhood by neighborhood, you know, sure. what it is. But think about comparing it to other investments. And that's hard right now because we have artificially low returns on everything. Right? Um, was it you or somebody earlier was talking about, you know, the 0.38 versus the 0 0.40, you know, Bill. Yeah. Yeah, Bill was talking about... Um, you know, he heard a, an older woman with some assets, and they're trying, the bank's trying to upsell her to a higher end account where she can get 0.4% on her money instead of 0.38. Woohoo! And Bill and I were talking about the fact that if she had a million dollars in that account, she's gonna get four grand a year. Right? It used to be if you got a million dollars in your account, you could retire. Yeah, 80,000 bucks a year. Uh -huh. Four grand a year. That, yeah. Take inflation into there, and yeah, it's even. She's gonna write them a check every year for a million is. bucks. Yeah. Well, Sean, I appreciate you coming out. Yeah, got a couple more. Oh yeah. Go for it. Um, I thought I had some really good news there. Um, Senate Bill 30, and I just remember that low number of uh, sales. One of the things that's hurting sales in California, and I think it's gonna hurt our economy this year is um, at the beginning, pretty early in the year, uh, the federal government extended um, the Mortgage Debt Relief Act, which basically says that if you go through a short sale and you're given $200,000 of debt relief, you don't have to pay taxes on that $200,000. Prior to January 1st, the same was true in California, but they haven't renewed that here in California. Now it's kind of a, you know, think, oh, well, you know, we can't afford to give up the taxes. We've never gotten any significant taxes for mortgage debt relief, right? It's only been these last few years, and it's been exempt these last few years. But for some reason, this is some game in, in Sacramento, and it's been held up in committee, Senate Bill 30, right? 
And so right now, if you go through a short sale, you're going to get a tax bill from California and, uh, up to 9%, depending on your income level, on the amount. And it's going to change your income level, so you'll pay higher taxes even on the rest of your income. So it's held up in committee. We got excited last week because it was coming out of committee finally. It got voted and approved yes. But they attached Senate Bill 391. So they said it's coming out of committee, but it can only be approved as Senate Bill 391 can be approved. And this tells you how Sacramento works right here. Senate Bill 391 adds a $75 tax to every document you want to record at the county. So you want to quick claim off to your to your wife because she has better credit and wants to finance. You want to put your property in a trust. You want you know to record refi. an option. You want to refi. 75 bucks every time. Sales transactions are exempt, right? Because they were hoping to not raise the ire of the California Association of Realtors. So on God yesterday or this morning, um, we got the news that the two had been separated and they were going to let SB 30 go for a stand-up vote one way or the other. Literally five hours later, our con contact there, right, called us back and said they're reattached. So, you know, the, the goal of the $75 is to f fund affordable housing, which there was dollars lost for that with all the redevelopment agency shakeup that we had, right, and so, but you know, trying to sneak through a $75 tax on, on recorded documents and by tying it to this other thing that people really want just doesn't seem like the right way. Um, it, it has me a little disgusted, frankly. And Senate Bill 30 is just the right thing to do. You know, folks that bought at the peak and have lost a bunch of value in their, in their property and have to short sell shouldn't get a tax bill. You know, California's never got that money before. I doubt they'll actually get the money if the person short sold their house. It's not like they got and got two hundred thousand dollars. It's not like they got a check, at eighteen grand to write a check. Um, you know, so it's just a ridiculous thing that this isn't passed yet. But you know, for folks looking at a short sale this year, you either got to just do it on the belief that the right. government's going to do the right thing before the end of the year when they issue tax bills, right? Or be prepared for a tax bill. And I think if they clean that up it would help with seeing more short sales happen. Absolutely. Yeah, contact your congressperson and tell them, look, tying SB 30 to SB 391 is unconscionable, and I hope you have no part of it, and I hope you make sure that SB 30 gets a straight up and down vote independent of any other crap you want to tie to it. Or drive into a gas truck and die. <laughs> That was my part. I added that on there. Yeah. Okay, last question. Right. Yeah. Um. Uh, it's it's uh, it's interesting times for sure. I mean, it's uh, um, you know uh, Charles Munger, uh, 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 who's the who's the Berkshire Warren Buffett's Buffett. guy, you know, um, basically said you know to a room of economists and market experts and the rest. I don't know exactly where this was, but he, he said, um, you know, anybody who isn't confused by this market doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, if you think you know what you're, is going to happen, I don't know what your basis of thought would be because we've never been in this situation before. So that's why I just warned of the black swan. I think, you know, you can't live in fear of that because yeah. there's it's, right now is an opportunity to get out and you know make hay while the haze, you know while it's while the sun is shining. While the sun is shining, um, but you should be prepared for, you know. I think it's going to be a bumpy ride for a little while. Have more than one exit strategy. Yep. Hopefully we'll see you back here on June 26th. We're going to have Dale Carnegie's uh, trainer here. And uh, Friday, this Friday, is the lunch, the Orange County Investors Lunch. It's at JT Smith's at the district. And uh, Investors Workshops will be running that lunch. It's the uh, last Friday of the month. Do I have that right? 
and we hope to see you on Friday. I'll be there. And uh, next month again on June 26th. So let's adjourn. Let's go out to the, to the, to the bar and uh, network. Thanks, guys.